So the future possibilities uh, that has been done by AME is the shielding uh, passives as indicated, the wafer bumping, interconnection, photonic layers, antennas, embedded technology, molding, die package uh, stacking, SMT, hybrid flex, interconnect, all as part of this, uh, of, of the AME capabilities that are coming into the, the equipment that is geared for this uh, technology. And, and, and the goal, the ultimate goal is to how to create a complete heterojunction integration of, uh, of these devices as um, shown here, where basically you have the substrate with uh, some interconnects and micro vias, then going to maybe a, a coupling capacitor and feeding into the photodetector photonics, some memory and microprocessor stacked and the ability to eliminate this uh, wire bonding is one of the things that AME is uh, coming into place and your ability to have your RF devices as well as creating an optical uh, waveguide are possible or possibilities by additive manufacturing. This would be the ultimate goal to create this. Uh, we are not there yet, but uh, eventually we'll, uh, I think the industry will reach this level of integration. So with this, um, this is the end of the, the what is AME, and I would like to return now the the screen to to Natalie, and uh, just want to remind everybody that the questions will, except for this presentation, the questions will be after each speaker. I will be moderating the questions from the the inputs that we get from you, and. Um, We'll, uh, uh, we have also a session of a, a summary session at the end after the last speaker, and I will answer any questions related to what is AME at that time. Natalie. Okay. Thank you, Chaim. Yes, I'm just gonna pull up the screen right now. Um, so our next speaker is Matthew Dyson from the ADD TechX. If Matthew, if you could join us here right now, come live. Hi, Matthew. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Fantastic. Um, so I'll just check if you can um, see my screen a second. Uh, let's share screen. Uh, I can't share the screen while someone else is sharing, apparently. Um, I am off. There's currently no one sharing, I believe. That's oh, wait. Okay. I that's am. True. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. So, no, that's fine. No problem. Uh, let's just uh, see that one and then should be able to have screen two. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, the, um, yeah, great. Okay, Thank, thanks very much, Natalie. Um, let me know if there's any audio visual problems. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Matthew Dyson. I'm a technology analyst at ID Tech X and I've been kindly invited by Nano Dimension to talk today uh, for about 35, 40 minutes or so on materials and processes for additively manufactured electronics. Now, if you were in the last AME Academy, then there is some overlap here, I'll just tell you in advance. Um, you know, we're aiming to, my aim is really to give you an overview of the field. And then this time, looking uh, with a particular focus on the materials and processes involved, um, so there's a slightly different structure, um, but also just to kind of give you some context around the applications and potential for additively manufactured uh, electronics uh, as a whole. So if I just briefly uh, introduce you to ID Tech X, um, we offer market research and market intelligence on a wide range of emerging technologies uh, that you can see here. Personally, I focus primarily on printed electronics and say so that includes things that range all the way from printed sensors to OLEDs to additive manu additively manufactured electronics as there are today. And so if you're interested in finding out anything more about us, uh, then please do uh, visit our website or get in touch with me uh, personally. So what am I gonna be talking about um, today? So I start off with this little overview. So of course there'll be an introduction to the technology um, uh, you know, in this sort of broader sense uh, and the potential applications. And then we're gonna look, as I said, at processes uh, and materials. Um, and then finally conclude with how we see the roadmap for additively manufactured electronics progressing. So let's start off uh, with this introduction. 
And this 3D additively manufactured electronics can be quite a difficult uh, term to define. And so I've, I've defined it here in the italics as adding electronic functionality via sequential deposition of material rather than using subtractive techniques, but that can take multiple different forms. And so there is what you might regard as sort of fully additive electronics, um, with like those practiced by nanodimension, um, where you kind of build up every layer sequentially and kind of start with a completely blank sheet. And then both the dielectric and the um, conductive functionality is combined. You may also integrate SMD components within that, which you know some people are working on. Um, and obviously, that enables you to add additional functionalities. Um, Another approach that you could also regard as additive electronics is taking an existing uh, material, be that some metal or plastic or whatever it is, and then additively printing your electronics on top of it. So rather than starting essentially with nothing and then building your electronics from the ground up, you start with something, uh, say some kind of 3D part, I don't know, for argument's sake of sort of plastic pipe or something, and then you could print your electronics, again, the conductive traces, the structural dielectrics, and maybe even some mounted components, onto this surface. And so these are these sort of two kind of competing approaches. approaches. And we can see those kind of set out here uh, in these pictures. So on the left, you've got this uh, image of uh, conductive inks being applied to the side of a plastic, what looks like a plastic tube. Um, and obviously this enables you to kind of use these kind of additive manufacturing methods and all of those advantages such as, you know, reduced use of material, digital manufacturing, all of those things that, we're, that are good, um, but apply it to much larger objects. And then on the other side, you have the fully additive printing, uh, where, as I say, you kind of start with nothing, and then you, you're printing the structure, you're printing the conductive traces, you may, may or may not be adding components. And here you can see that there's some uh, resistors and an IC uh, integrated within the, the complete plastic structure. Um, and then so we then uh, come to the motivation, which I think is, is always a kind of really important part of these kind of talks where, you know, you're discussing some kind of new technology and that, you know, many people will show you what they can do. But of course, that doesn't necessarily tell you that it's worth doing. Um, and so I've kind of adapted a graphic here from somebody else. I added some of my own categories as well. Um, to look at the motivation for additively manufactured electronics. And this is divided up into three parts. So over on the left, we have the design flexibility. And you know, at, since you're creating it from the ground up, uh, you can basically make it any shape you want. And that's quite a big selling point. And it fits into this kind of wider theme of electronics increasingly taking the shape of any shape you like, rather than having to design a device, an object around the circuit board, you could design your device to be whatever shape you want. And the electronics will can either fit within that shape or indeed be kind of structurally integrated. So some plastic that would have a structural um, requirement is there to be, form part of the structure could instead have electronics uh, integrated within it. And there are also these other be benefits sort of down towards the bottom here, such as, you know, adding new functionality. And, and we've, you know, we've just heard that we can integrate things like capacitors, uh, you know, without having to mount a separate capacitor, you can integrate those via um, additively manufactured electronics you know, within the structure, and that could potentially enable you to have some quite large capacitors. Um, everything is very robust because it's all integrated within the structural dielectric rather than being a separate, a separate piece that could be damaged. You get, and you get these benefits of mass customization in that because these are being printed digitally um, you know, without any masks or anything, uh, each device can be subtly different. So if you have a whole series that have sort of slightly different requirements or slightly different designs or need to be slightly different shapes and kind of in the future designing something like a hearing aid or some other kind of medical device would be a good example of this, um, then it's really beneficial to be able to change how each of those devices is made without a significant change in cost. So you can kind of decouple uh, the kind of price from the volume that you're making, the, the unit price from the unit volume. Uh, then we get on to the sort of economics and, you know, there's going to be fewer parts, shorter process chains, less, less materials. Uh, and then perhaps down at the bottom, one that's perhaps under considered is the ability to do rapid design iterations. And I think particularly for kind of smaller um, runs, you know, where these 
are going to some sort of ni- maybe a niche application or, or you know, used in kind of R&D or small volume specialist production, the ability to kind of, to you know, make your device and get get some feedback on the prototype, you know, in, in a few hours or a day or two, rather than having to sort of ship everything off and then wait a few weeks or even months uh, is quite important. And then over on the right in green is the sort of environmental benefits that, you know, you might think that there's a, there might be a kind of environmental challenge in integrating the dielectric and the conductive materials, and that could challenge recycling. And at, at present, that is probably true that they might be quite tricky to, de- to recycle, but you've got to remember what they're replacing. And, you know, they're no harder to recycle than a conventional circuit board, um, but with the considerable advantages that you're using a smaller range of materials, um, the parts are going to be significantly lighter and that brings environmental benefits kind of throughout the supply chain um and ultimately there's the potential to kind of develop technologies that could for example uh, dissolve away the dielectric and then just leave you with the conductive ink and the components um, which would obviously facilitate recycling and but i think you know in terms of the environmental benefits you know you've got to consider it as a kind of whole life cycle and think okay if we can integrate electronics structurally then you know the items themselves can be lighter and smaller and that brings a big environmental benefit in terms of shipping and all of those kind of things uh, so when we go on to have a look at the potential applications so uh, this is a sort of general overview that you know and i think this this corresponds to what, to what we saw kind of 10 15 minutes ago uh, is that over time there'll be increased functionality and integration of electronics into everyday items and so at present you know we see um, additively manufactured electronics being used for kind of prototyping or very kind of specific use cases and we'll, we'll look at some of those um, but over time we can imagine as we saw in those kind of um, sort of idealized plots for the or figures for the future of electronics uh, we could imagine incorporating all kinds of different functionalities within all kinds of different plastic parts. And so this idea that you know one supplier makes the plastic, another supplier makes the electronics, and then probably another person bolts it together will disappear. And you'll end up with something where electronics are a fundamental part of many, many items that you buy. And then clearly over time, those will obviously become smaller and more compact until the kind of dream scenario where you end up with something that is a sort of small and precise as an um, hearing aid or a headphone can be custom made to suit your specific ear and have all of the electronics structurally integrated within it. So you get this really robust bespoke part with extensive um, functionalities. So I've taken the different um, applications for additive manufactured electronics here, and I'm presenting them on this kind of uh, uh, schematic, if you like, where I'm plotting area on the uh, x-axis versus whether or not they're fully or partially additive. So just to recap, fully additive means we're creating the object from the ground up, whereas partially additive means that the electronics are being added onto an existing uh, three-dimensional, normally three-dimensional surface. And so we can see that we start kind of over on the left. I'll just get my laser pointer here. So we start over on the left um, with these advanced electronics packaging. We obviously it's very small. It's about new ways of you know building up things like um, system in package or having multiple chips within the same package and you know replacing wire bonding with a perhaps slightly more sophisticated. Um, set of interconnects um, through to sort of packaging, microfluidics, and then you sort of start heading towards the larger uh, applications, things like circuit prototyping and the integrated devices that I've just mentioned. And obviously the areas here could, you know, these are just kind of broad outlines of their sort of approximate area. And then over on the top right, there's a sort of whole nother category here, which still just about fall within the uh, sort of 3D additive electronics category um, of replacing wiring on 3D surfaces. So if you think about the inside of a plane or even a car, there's all kinds of wiring in there uh, and those could be replaced with additively manufactured electronics. So I'm briefly gonna speak about each of these in turn and then we'll get on to look at some of the processes uh, that can, faci- can facilitate um, additively manufactured electronics. So here's um, just a few examples uh, on advanced electronics packaging. And so at present, this is pretty much an R&D type topic, but it's, it's certainly something that's attracting a lot of attention. And there's also people doing it kind of in other ways that you could regard as sort of somewhat additive. 
Uh, things like laser direct structuring is also kind of targeting this area. Uh, and, and the basic idea, as I say, is that you could have these sort of three dimensional interconnects and move and sort of embed your chips kind of directly within some plastic rather than sort of having to package them separately or you could combine multiple chips in the same package. Um, and so this is, yeah, ultimately there's a huge, there's a potential, there's a huge kind of addressable market there and that, you know, there's an awful lot of packaged chips out there, but you'll need to demonstrate, you know, really good yields and, and um, reliability uh, to kind of get into that market. Because obviously, you know, it's a highly automated process that's been going for years. Um, but there's quite a lot of potential, particularly for devices such as phones, where, you know, space is a real constraint. And if you can use this additively manufactured um electronics to reduce the amount of waste, wasted space in your chip package. You know, you can make a thinner phone or have a bigger, a thicker battery or whatever it is. And so those kind of applications where, where kind of space is really at a premium, I think are probably the most promising uh, for this advanced electronics packaging. Uh, in a similar way, you could also use um, additively manufactured electronics to package optical components. And, you know, we hear a lot of discussion about um, adding more and more optical sensors of increasing complexity, you know, particularly to vehicles, but also for industrial processes and, um, you know, even domestically as part of the Internet of Things, you know, to sort of monitor, I don't know, your fridge, all, all kinds of things. Um, and so these sensors obviously need to be mounted and they need to, that needs to be robust. Um, and if you're having kind of, um, you know, very, very small volume uh, type manufacturing, then again, additive manufacturing is, is, is a promising way to go. And the better you can integrate those sensors into your product, the more robust it will be. You can potentially miss out a few steps of the supply chain. Uh, but the, the sort of technologies are pretty similar to the, uh, ad the advanced electronics packaging. Then you get on to microfluidics, which I think is, a, is an area that, that has a lot of potential. And, and of course, one of the challenges here is that the people who are experts on microfluidics tend not to be the people who are experts on additively manufactured electronics. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's this sort of idea of sort of lab on a chip and or having sort of um, wearable skin patches that can do some electronic analysis on your sweat are all are all very compelling. Uh, and additively manufactured electronics will allow you to have kind of multiple different structures in there, maybe integrate different types of sensors. And you could obviously build into that as part of that 3D printing process, you can build in maybe some channels um, that would enable the fluids to, you know, move around under capillary action uh, as normal. And potentially, you know, this could be integrated with some chip packaging. And you can imagine a world where, you know, as was shown earlier, where you have all of these different functionalities, including the microfluidics and the electronics, you know, all manufactured, you know, by the same machine from the same supplier, and you just kind of send send over your, your digital blueprints for what you want. And then out comes these integrated devices, which would enable you to do kind of small volume production runs and you know, specific designs and iterate through various designs much more, much more quickly. Um, as we're gradually moving up in scale here, we have a look at circuit prototyping. And so there's different way, different uh, companies kind of in this space offering, you know, different kind of levels of complexity and uh, capabilities in terms of uh, mounting components. And uh, nano dimension sort of falls somewhere between these two categories and that it can be used for circuit prototyping and it can be used for fully th uh, sort of fully 3D printed uh, items. Um, and certainly the circuit prototyping is, is a promising application. Yeah, it's, it's certainly people, you know, this is a service that people require, um, but it's not necessarily you know, there's only a certain amount of uh, circuit boards that need to be prototyped. And it also sort of works better at the earlier stages because, you know, you're probably going to want to prototype your final design once it gets manufactured uh, in bulk. But of course, this approach can work if you're only if you're manufacturing in very small volumes, then this doesn't even need to be a prototype. You could just be manufacturing your final circuit board uh, with these additive methods. Uh, here's a few more examples of integrated devices. Um, again, I've kind of already mentioned these, so it's just a matter of incorporating the electronics and the um, printed uh, conductors within the dielectric. And you can see that for these accelerometers and types of sensors. And then also this printing the wiring onto the 3D surfaces, which I think is, is kind of a few kind of orders of magnitude and scale higher than, than what many people perceive as um, 
3D electronics, but it, I think it nonetheless is a pretty promising application in that it, there's a there's a sort of genuine need to reduce weight and potential for errors that we, you would associate with wiring harnesses by integrating uh, that technology more fully. And that's al already kind of receiving quite a lot of interest um, for uh, some applications that you might not think of, such as airline seating, where you know weight is obviously a priority there. And you know, business and first class seats have all kinds of wiring in them to serve all the buttons and screens and things. And so if that can be integrated and, you know, you get a 10% weight reduction, that's probably well worth the cost. So on to um, some of these processes. So I've outlined a whole range of processes uh, that are associated with additively manufactured electronics here. And you can see that I've kind of divided them up uh, into four categories. And I'm going to sort of briefly uh, look at each of these in turn. And so many of these technologies are kind of, you know, can be used in other places. You know, if you're just printing normal conductive inks, you know, and all of these curing and sintering methods apply, like similar with the ink deposition, you know, component placement, you know, can be taken from say either micro LED or conventional circuit manufacturing. Um, and so, and to, to an extent, the, the challenge of as we manufacture electronics is to pull all these different technologies together um, to do to do something new. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, there's a material being deposited into specific locations, that material is being cured or sintered, um, and components may be mounted on there. You know, in and of themselves, each of those technologies in general has been done before. The challenge is to combine them and, and create something uh, that is, you know, reliable and reproducible and, and it enables the kind of degree of control uh, that you're looking for with these kind of digital manufacturing methods. So just a quick look at the different types of digital printing. And I imagine you're pretty much everyone's familiar with inkjet printing, where you just have some sort of piezoelectric crystal that squeezes out the ink, um, or it can heat it up and sort of expel it out with some heat. Uh, but there's some more innovative uh, technologies here as well that you might be less familiar with. So one of those is um, laser-induced forward transfer. And I'll come to each of these in turn in a moment, um, which is, is kind of in its very early stages. I think there's one company trying to commercialize it. Um, but that has the potential for quite rapid ink deposition. Aerosol jet is very well suited to printing onto conformal surfaces. So arguably for things like advanced packaging is certainly something uh, that's being targeted um, where you want to add 3D electronics to some kind of conformal surface. And then there's two other over on the right, very high resolution techniques that are perhaps a little more obscure, uh, such as electrohydrodynamic printing and ultra precise deposition, which uh, and then the aim with these is that you can get down to very, very narrow lines, uh, like sort of one micron uh, width. But of course, that comes at the cost of speed, at least in general. And then if we were to sort of look at these on this plot of sort of printing resolution uh, versus technological readiness, uh, again, this is just a kind of broad overview. Um, we can see that unsurprisingly inkjet is the most established. If you want to print a sort of viscous line, uh, viscous ink that's quite in quite a thick trace, you can kind of extrude that. Um, and then these kind of uh, higher resolution techniques are kind of lurking up towards the top of this diagram. And you know, at present are mainly being sold into kind of R&D or academia, academic type applications uh, rather than used for commercial scale manufacturing. So just a quick overview of some of these techniques in case you're unfamiliar with them. Um, so the basics of um, laser induced forward transfer is that you have a glass carrier plate. It has some kind of ink, could be conductive, could be dielectric on the underneath. The laser scans around on top uh, that vaporizes, uh, selectively vaporizes some of the solvent in the ink that expands, creates a little bubble and then a little droplet of ink pops off. And you can kind of imagine this as sort of a sort of halfway house between inkjet printing and laser direct structuring. So we get the kind of choice of material that we'd get with inkjet and the ability to put drops of what we, whatever material we want, wherever we like, but we kind of get the speed of uh, laser direct structuring because the patterning is being achieved optically. We don't need to physically move around a nozzle. We just need to angle a mirror slightly and then move the laser around. And so this is a, is a pretty promising technique um, that you know multiple people are investigating. There's quite a lot of academic work on it, um, but it's you know there are challenges such as how do you keep reloading the carrier plate? You know, can you do it reproducibly and reliably? How small are the features that you can make with it? Um, and you know just the, all the challenges associated with developing some kind of new printing technology, uh, which can be quite tricky. 
Um, but certainly, I think this has got a lot of promise. And I think, um, you know, not just in, in sort of 3D electronics, but in um, printed electronics in general, uh, this seems to have the potential for kind of very high speed printing of, you know, multiple different materials. And you can, because it's kind of getting, you don't have to move a nozzle that's very close to the surface. You can have a sort of relatively long working distance here. Um, and hence, you can go on to slightly, slightly conformal substrates. Uh, aerosol deposition, you might well be more familiar with. There's a rather nice uh, photo here where you can see this very thin stream of collimated ink. And the basic idea here, as you might well know, is that you have some kind of carrier gas um, that encloses a sort of atomized beam or vaporized beam of the conductive or dielectric ink. It's normally, con normally conductive, uh, and that enables you to print the uh, traces that you want. And you can see some examples where this has been printed onto conformal surfaces uh, because of that long working distance. And you can also get features down to you know, about 10 microns. Um, then we get onto a couple of these slightly more obscure techniques, as I mentioned. So you have electrohydrodynamic printing, which utilizes an electric field um, to kind of drag the ink out of the nozzle. Uh, and then this can again enable features down to a micron. You can see some of these very thin traces over here. And then there's this kind of innovation where you can sort of use a MEMS chip, or at least it's claimed that you can use a MEMS chip, to, which would contain thousands of these little nozzles to increase your throughput rate. Uh, and then we get on to this uh, ultra precise deposition, which is the key distinction here is that you can print very narrow, but very high viscosity inks. And because they're high viscosity, uh, you can have quite a high aspect ratio and you can print these uh, very narrow lines indeed, you know, down again, down to kind of one or two microns. And the basic idea here is that you use some kind of specially formulated ink that's shear thinning. And this, as it's put under pressure and squeezed out of this nozzle, uh, it flows, but of course, once that pressure is removed, um, it, the ink doesn't flow anymore. So if you've ever done the experiment with a knife and um, you know water and corn flour, and it suddenly goes solid when you try and shear it, this is the opposite. So this will shear very easily uh, when any pressure uh, is applied. Um, and it's quite quite different from many of these other um, very techniques for high resolution printing, and that enables. Uh, high viscosity inks and hence high aspect ratios and thus high conductivity. And it's again looking at kind of applications like advanced packaging or sort of repairs on TFT backplanes. Of course, the challenge is that it's quite slow. So if we were to briefly compare um, these different uh, technologies on this kind of technological commercial readiness scale kind of chart. Uh, you can see the aerosol jet was previously uh, co used commercially for manufacturing mobile phone antennas, but that project is sadly, uh, as far as I'm aware, no longer happening. Um, single nozzle ink jet for printed electronics is kind of commercially being used for printed electronics, but not as much as you might expect. Uh, screen printing still dominates. And then obviously people want to use multiple nozzles to speed that up. Uh, and then you end up with these um, much higher resolution techniques, which kind of are in the marketplace, as in you can go and buy those machines, but not necessarily being used for manufacturing products that you can buy in the shops. So the machines are commercially available, but mainly sold into uh, R&D and academia. So then I get on to my uh, next category as we uh, a bit shorter. Uh, looking at sort of curing and sintering methods. And some of these are sort of relatively obvious. Um, you know, you, we all know that we can cure inks by heating them up and, you know, we can take solder and do reflow processes by heating it. And that's all fairly standard. Uh, the more interesting ones are the photonic curing, uh, plasma curing, which is kind of an emerging technology. And of course, you can sort of selectively cure spatially um, with a laser as well. Um, so you, you may well be familiar uh, with Novacentrix. Um, they're sort of quite well known, I think. And their basic approach is what you can see here, um, where you have your printed material. And in this case, it's an RFID antenna. But of course, it could be a layer of your um, 3D print of your sort of um, additively manufactured electronics, just a layer of either dielectric or conductive ink. And then you shine um, pulses of very bright, high intensity light at it. Uh, and then that induces the temperature of the silver to rise, but the temperature of some less absorbent, perhaps even transparent uh, dielectric to rise a lot less. And hence, you can kind of selectively cure uh, just the absorbing material very quickly without having to heat everything up. 
And so the advantage here is that, that, that there's a lot of increased speed because you know, you're firing these very high, very bright pulses. Um, there's a lack of kind of overall thermal damage and you don't have to wait for everything to heat up and cool down. But of course you sort of have to pay for the equipment and there are potentially some challenges in that if you've incorporated some SMD components within that, you might have to mask them to protect them from the, from the lighting. Um, there's also a, an innovative approach here that you might not be aware of where inks can be cured using plasma. So many of you might know that plasma uh, treatments are used to kind of change the surface energy of glass or quartz. If you're sort of in a laboratory, you've got a surface, you can do some plasma treatments and create some dangling bonds and change the surface energy, as you can see here. Uh, but you can also apply um, plasma treatments to cure some conductive inks, and that's being developed by this uh, early stage German firm called Oraltech. Uh, and the key benefit here is that it can all be done at very, very low temperature. So because it's the plasma that's doing it rather than the heat, uh, ultimately you can do things at 70 degrees or below, which dramatically opens up the choice of substrates uh, that you can use. And so I think this is sort of a relatively promising approach. Of course, you know, it needs quite a lot of testing to see what could withstand your plasma. You know, can you, is that easy to integrate into existing machinery? Possibly not. Um, there are some challenges there, but certainly it's the kind of lowest temperature uh, curing process uh, that I've seen uh, that I think is, is, is quite promising. And of course, you know, the, the time, of course, depends on many things, um, but it's probably quicker than just doing it purely thermally. So we now move on to the, the third of my four categories, uh, which is component placement. And so there's basically two options here. So one of those is pick and place, which, you know, I think probably everybody who you knows anything about electronics manufacturing is familiar with, um, where, you know, there's a little vacuum chuck and it picks the components off the tape and puts them where you want. And if you've got a diverse mix of components, that's great. It's well established. It's widely used. And there are already people um, using pick and place within their kind of 3D printers um, or circuit prototyping um, equipment. And so, the question then is, why would you want to do anything else? And so there are a couple of downsides. And so one is that if you're going to be moving bare rather than packaged dies around, they can be quite fragile and then the vacuum chuck and then rapidly moving them can cause problems. And obviously, as we as we go towards kind of more integrated electronics, we might want to move away from packaged components and kind of put the dies straight into our sort of structural dielectric rather than have this separate packaging step. Uh, and another is that if you have a lot of similar components, uh, this can be relatively slow. You know, you'd have to go back if you wanted to make a little area that was covered in um, identical, fairly small LEDs, for example, uh, you'd have to go back and pick them all up, not necessarily individually, because you might have multiple heads, but you wouldn't be able to carry that many of them across at a time. Uh, so that's led to a lot of uh, effort and investment going into alternatives. Again, not necessarily, or indeed not particularly for 3D printed electronics, um, but they're to, they are sort of to an extent transferable. And so these be things like direct die placement, which is where you're basically pushing the component directly off the wafer. And if you have a situation where you have, want to mount a lot of similar components uh, and you want to do that quite quickly, uh, this is quite a good method. Uh, and there's various approaches here. So there's over on the right is a diagram showing a printhead pushing through mini LEDs um, from a wafer onto a substrate. And that's developed by Rohini. It's already being commercialized for making keyboard backlights and soon to be for mini um, LED, uh, sorry, uh, mini LED backplanes for LCD TVs. And there's also this sort of uh, another emerging approach which kind of utilizes the um, you have your you have your uh, weight your chips or your components on some kind of flexible carrier plate, and you utilize the bending of that carrier plate to kind of, to selectively deposit them where you want. And so the key difference with pick and place here is that you're sort of punching these directly off the wafer. Clearly, these if you have some kind of extremely conformal three dimensional objects, these methods are obviously not ideal. But if you have a relatively flat surface, or if you wanted to embed, say, a lot of mini LEDs within a layer during the manufacturing process, then these methods uh, could be quite quick. And they're certainly sort of gaining some traction, even though, of course, pick and place is by far the dominant method for component mounting. So the last section here is that although we've been talking about additively manufacturing, that doesn't mean that we have to be restricted to entirely additive approaches. 
And there's some scope for introducing non-additive methods alongside the additive ones, uh, taking a sort of pragmatic approach uh, where you can try and sort of get the best of both worlds. And that, that's what these methods uh, enable. And so one of those would be spooling out wires. And that's particularly applicable for power electronics, where just printing the circuitry isn't necessarily sufficient. Uh, and so if you had an, an application where you needed either, say, either fiber optics to be integrated in there uh, or relatively thick wires for carrying large currents, then you could spool out wire either over an existing uh, surface or over some um, 3D printed dielectric. And then you could encase that um, via some additional 3D printing just to avoid having to have the extra insulation. And so again, this enables the electronics to be integrated within the part, thus kind of completely within this additively manufactured electronics approach, but that the, com the conductive uh, component or perhaps the optical one doesn't necessarily need to be printed. It might, it's advantageous to print it out if you have complex patterns and relatively small current requirements. But if you have a simple pattern and quite a big current requirement, it might be better to just spool out the wire and then can encapsulate that within a, a printed dielectric. And so I think, again, that's quite a promising approach. And, and often I think it's a good move to not necessarily say, OK, we, you know, we just purely do additive manufacturing. It might be better to, to if the use case requires it, to sort of take, a, take an approach from an existing uh, technology and you know, see how you can adapt that to work within an overall primarily additive framework. Uh, then, I don't know what's happened to the title here, apologies for that. Um, so then you can do uh, laser ablation where you print out uh, some metal. And so rather than trying to print very fine traces, which is quite slow, you can instead print a relatively wide area uh, and then ablate away. And so this is being used here to make the uh, connections for the to contact a chip. And you can obviously you need quite a fine pattern there, quite a high resolution. So you can do some laser ablation to produce that kind of patterning, um, again, allowing you to sort of speed things up slightly. Uh, and then you can also do some sort of CNC drilling or milling. And again, this has been adopted by Enscript. And if you have some kind of component, some kind of uh, existing rigid plastic, you might want to embed some wires into that and then some, some printed functionality or some printed wires into that, and then print your structural dielectric over the top. Um, this could well be a good approach. Again, it's something that you're not going to be using you know, in its entirety, it does obviously that wouldn't count as additively manufactured. But that's not to say that there's not some benefit in using it occasionally, or if you require um, some particular, some shape uh, or very sharp edge that was challenging to print. Um, so, quick look here um, at the materials. Um, obviously, I know where we're sort of heading towards the end of this talk. So, I'll be in, in another kind of five to 10 minutes or so, leave a bit of time for questions. Um, so if we look at these materials relative electronics, here I've mapped out the whole range of different uh, conductive inks. And obviously, they're an essential aspect of actually manufactured electronics. And there's many different approaches. And you can see their kind of approximate conductivities here. Um, I'd emphasize that you know, for many applications, conductivity isn't necessarily the most important requirement. If you're only interested in um, you know, capacitive touch sensing, for example, you're probably not too worried about it. And more important to cost and, and durability and yield and ease of processing and all of those other factors that are a bit harder to put on a graph. Um, nonetheless, we can see that these kind of broadly fall into two categories in that you have the kind of metal based ones up at the top and unsurprisingly, the non metal based ones in lower conductivity uh, down towards the bottom. And then a couple of these categories can also be transparent, um, which is something that you know, I don't think that at present many people are looking at this, you know, the idea of doing completely transparent additively manufactured electronics, but it's certainly possible. Um, and there are probably some sort of applications for it, um, you know, may, maybe in the kind of optical component uh, type sphere or integrating some kind of functionality into car windows or something like that. But if you were to use CNTs or silver nanowires, you could have additively manufactured transparent electronics as well. Um, one point that I mentioned briefly that, again, I think is, is sometimes forgotten when looking at these conductive inks is the, the importance of uh, 
the, the frequency dependent uh, conductivity and the fact that, you know, just taking the DC conductivity, which is what manufacturers normally give you, is not necessarily the best indicator of how that material is going to perform at high frequency. Um, where, of course, the skin depth is a lot lower. So if you're trying to make RF antenna, for example, then, you know, you're, all the conductivity is happening quite close to the surface. And so the roughness then plays a significant role, um, you know, along with the bulk conductivity. And so that is certainly something to consider. And there's a nice little comparison here between a, a, a image here from Electron, Electron Inc., who I think spoke at the last AME event, and a nanoparticle-based ink, and you can see that the particle-free inks are much smoother, and thus typically have to have better conductivity at high frequencies, you know, for, this, for the same uh, thickness and width. There's also, um, when we think about the dielectrics now, um, one of the main challenges here is the uh, matching the thermal expansion coefficients. And this has been told to me by a couple of people that if you want things that are durable, you know, maybe suitable for the automotive or aerospace sector, they need to understand uh, withstand quite a wide range of temperatures and particularly withstand thermal cycling. You know, if you have a car in a hot place, then it will go from maybe freezing at night up to say 40 degrees during the day. And it's going to do that repeatedly. And, and because you know, metal and plastic have very different thermal and mechanical properties, that can clearly lead to failure. And so one of the suggestions here is that the, um, the dielectric is uh, embedded with say, in this case, silicon, but maybe other materials uh, to more closely match its thermal properties with that of the ink. And thus, there will be a lot less um, differential expansion uh, during thermal cycling and thus increased reliability. The additional benefit is that if you can increase the thermal conductivity of your dielectric, uh, then you can transport heat away from the wires or particularly away from any integrated circuits. And that would reduce any thermal gradients and hence reduce uh, any potential damage coming from these different expansion coefficients. And so I think it certainly as these um, additively manufactured components get larger and deal um, you know, with higher frequencies, higher currents, uh, managing this heat uh, generated within them is going to become more and more important. And you know, it's probably possible to just print some wires in there that are purely there for thermal rather than electrical conductivity. But you can also think about altering the dielectric, uh, embedding different materials within them, and changing the, sort of th the thermal and mechanical properties of that dielectric as well. And I, and I think that's something that's going to increasingly see attention as additively manufactured electronics becomes more popular. Um, I'd also mention, I think, yeah, uh, these materials for low loss dielectrics. So obviously 5 and 6G are kind of fairly hot topics at the moment. Certainly at IDTech X, we see a lot of interest in those. Um, and so just, just a quick little example of some different materials and their dielectric constant uh, DK. And if you want to, um, you know, minimize the dielectric loss, so, you know, at high frequencies and thus improve the efficiency of your antennas, then you wouldn't want to choose dielectric materials that you can print um, that have quite low dielectric constants. So that tends to be things that are fluorinated, but liquid crystalline polymers are kind of other options. And, you know, at present, I think most people are focused on, you know, just having a system that works uh, and, you know, having a dielectric that is compatible with their printing system and compatible with their curing method and their conductive inks. But as time progresses, you know, more of these additional factors are likely to become important. And, you know, people start worrying about the dielectric properties for antennas and maybe even have tunable dielectrics um, so that they can adjust the antenna frequencies and all kinds of things. So I think that that's certainly an area that's going to receive uh, increasing amounts of interest. And I think my last uh, sort of material here is these uh, conductive adhesives. And so if you, this is mainly applies if you want to integrate components within your um, additively manufactured structure. And so just a couple of examples here showing two different uh, ways of uh, um, having a field aligned adhesive, which makes it uh, easier to mount the components. You don't need sort of such small um, solder pads or anything. You can just put down a kind of uniform layer and then the uh, the conduction is just isotropic. And this can also be used for uh, anisotropic thermal conduction uh, if that's needed as well. So over on the left, you have um, using an electric field to line up the conductive particles uh, to make it conductive in just one direction. And that makes a kind of film. And then over on the right is a kind of broadly similar approach, this time using a magnetic field where the conductive particles are aligned by applying a magnetic field during curing. Again, with the benefit that this should simplify uh, the mounting of um, components, particularly those with kind of that require relatively high pad resolutions. So that brings me towards the very last section of my talk. So I'd just like to 
um, highlight that you know everyone talks about sustainability these, these days. It's an increasingly important topic. And so there's a within the kind of materials and technologies, you know, here are some sort of possible options um, in terms of improving the sustainability of these things. As I said earlier, if you do the whole life cycle assessment, you're probably winning with the reduced weight. Um, but here, here are some other examples, things like using biodegradable materials such as cellulose-based plastic. There's a lot of interest in those at the moment, even within the printed electronics world. Um, and you know, potentially incorporating recycling information, have a little IC and an RFID antenna in there. So when you scan the part, you can determine, you know, how it needs to be recycled. If we then have a look at this kind of roadmap, and I've taken this uh, from the whole center, they see uh, this kind of um, gradual projection. And it's pretty much the one I spoke about earlier, moving sort of from prototyping, scaling up, and then up to mass production. And they also show some of the um, Sort of throughputs and re resolutions that will be required to achieve this um, with this sort of relatively high, I'm almost there, one more slide, um, uh, units per hour. So that takes me uh, to my last slide, um, which is just kind of roadmap. And again, you can see uh, this, that's pretty much what I said at the beginning, circuit prototyping is well established. Uh, and then you can see the other applications there with integrated devices uh, being on the kind of longest timeline. So I'll lead you to read the summary uh, by yourself and um, I'll happily answer any questions. Okay, Matthew, uh, thank you very much for this enlightening presentation as usual. Um, we have a lot of questions, but very short time, so I will uh, pick a few of them so we can uh, address them. Uh, there are several that came and uh, all of them are very good. But um, let's start with uh, some base of the, the technology. You indicated <laughs> in, uh, uh, this, this came out from uh, somebody in Europe actually. Um, you indicated uh, that inkjet uh, limit is about the 100 micron range. Uh, yeah. However, there are uh, uh, companies, uh, especially the manufacturing uh, inkjet uh, inks, that they uh, claim, and also inkjet uh, printer head manufacturer, they claim that they can go to sub 50 microns. Can you comment on that? Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, I was just kind of dragging out the kind of general range. And so, you know, most inkjet printers that people are using are kind of round about there. Um, I'm, I know that there are people, you know, developing particular high resolution um, technologies. And I'd be, I'd be very happy to talk to the company in question if you send me their details, uh, learn more, and then make the, make the appropriate adjustments for next time. Okay. Uh, the other question is... Uh... For copper, how do people are controlling the oxidation of the copper during the additive manufacturing process? So the challenge here, as you say, that, so the oxidation is a big challenge. And I think it's generally it's controlled by kind of adding reducing agents into the ink itself. So that whilst it sits, so, you know, one approach is to do the entire thing in an inert atmosphere, but clearly that's expensive and annoying. Um, so the, the approach developed by Copperint and Print CB, and I think perhaps others, is to incorporate reducing agents directly into the ink. And then while it's heated, uh, these reducing agents ensure that the copper isn't oxidized. And then obviously the copper would just oxidize over time. But if you're doing it within additively manufact additive manufacturing, the copper would probably be then it kind of embedded or enclosed within the structural dielectric. So the kind of longer term um, oxidation would be less of a problem. So to answer it very quickly, they're just putting reducing agents into the ink itself. Okay, another question, this came from the West Coast in the US. Um, how to solder vertically stacked ICs? I'm, I'm sorry? How sorry, to just solder you... vertically stacked ICs? How can you solder them? Yeah. Um, so I think that's the way that I've seen people looking at it, it, it within the context of additively manufactured electronics is that they'll, um, print some sort of fan out array that the IC will then sort of stick out from. And then there'll be some kind of essentially vias, but they're being kind of 3D printed upwards. And then you can print a layer of dielectric and then put your next chip on top. And so ultimately you're printing the kind of associated wiring around them rather than necessarily soldering them. Of course, this is also an option with these conductive adhesives that I mentioned. Some of those have enable kind of uh, line space ratios of I think 10 microns for each. Um, and so that, that there could well be an opportunity uh, to employ those as well. Um, you could obviously do conventional soldering, um, but you know, that comes with these sort of temperature challenges uh, that might not be compatible with your dielectric and, and so on. Okay, an interesting question here. Do you see AME type of technology eventually building as ICs? Good question. 
Personally, no. I certainly see it packaging ICs for kind of either relatively niche or kind of very space constrained applications. Um, I would, I see. It, I think it's very, very unlikely that silicon ever gets replaced. You know, if you look at the latest sort of um, transistor width, they're down at what is it, seven, seven nanometers or something. So I think it's pretty challenging to get anywhere near that um, with any, with any other methods. You know, they're, 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 the latest silicon chips have taken so long to develop that I don't. I think it's very hard for any other technologies to compete with that. Okay, and the, this, uh, I, there are many more questions, but then, uh, we'll try to answer them uh, later on at the end uh, okay. of the overall academy. But the last question, a uh, short question here, is it possible to see the material changes during curing to control the process? Uh, yes, I mean, you can obviously, you can sort of inspect it visually and there'll be some kind of color change, but obviously that's fair, fairly imprecise. Um, I would imagine that it's highly, po highly possible to, to see that spectroscopically um, as these things change, you, the reflectivity will change, your, your color will probably change, um, you know, your metals will get less rough. Whether P I'm not currently aware of anyone employing any spectroscopic monitoring techniques during the curing process. Um, set within the additively manufactured world. I know people are looking at it within the sort of wider printed electronics approach, doing um, sort of ellipsometry and all kinds of things. Um, but within additive manufacturing, you may well be doing it, James, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of anyone using spectroscopy during sort of 3D electronics manufacturing. Okay, uh, Matthew, thanks a lot for this uh, Thank you. lighting presentation and I'll uh, turn back to Natalie for introducing the next yeah, one. If, if anyone has any uh, further questions, then I, my email address will just be up at the bottom here. So do feel free to email me uh, and I can try and get back to you. Just m.dyson at idtechx.com. Thanks very much. Exactly, and for Matthew. everyone who would have missed his email address, just write to Amy Academy and we'll make sure to forward your request to the um, specific speaker of the seminar. But thank you again, Matt, for joining thank us you. today. I will now, um, just a quick reminder, so any anything shared in the chat, if you have questions, please do post them in the Q&A so we can follow up with them. Should um, questions not be answered during the seminar, we will make sure to forward them to the speakers and then um, they will be able to follow up with those specifically and you can also communicate um, with them later on. So for now, our next speaker is Oliver Reffle from the Fraunhofer IPA. Um, thank you, Oliver, for joining us today. We're really excited. Matt, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off your camera. Oh yes, certainly, sorry. No yeah. worries, and put you on mute. Um, I will um, let you have the floor and introduce yourself. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Natalie, for your kind introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me uh, loud and clearly. So at first I'll start sharing my screen. Um, to start my presentation about embedding AM technologies in hybrid process chains for customized production of micromechatronic systems. So that will be my talk. So at first, some, some words about me. My name is Oliver Reflin. Um, I am head of department for additive manufacturing um, at Fraunhofer IPA. I'll give a short introduction about Fraunhofer Society and IPA at first. Um, and then I'll uh, make the next step. So in, in the next 45 minutes, you will actually hear <clears throat> or see um, two different examples of uh, how to, to implement or to integrate electronics in, let's say, uh, different dimensions and scales into additively manufactured parts. Okay, I see there, there's something wrong with the screen sharing. <clears throat> so hopefully now you have my screen, do you? Yes, Oliver, we have your screen on. Yeah, you? that's great. Thanks uh, for this short feedback. <clears throat> so um, I already gave you uh, the verbal introduction to the agenda. At first, I'll give you a short overview on my institute, <clears throat> where I'm working uh, for, then what we are doing here about additive manufacturing. Uh, and then um, I'll give you a short uh, motivation why we are dealing with uh, 3D printing with electronic functionality as one, one part of our daily work. And then uh, I'll, I'll uh, come to the main part with two project examples. The one project was called Next Factory, and the other one is about uh, individualized sensors, which we uh, both actually we, we, we did with several companies 
as you will see later on. So at first, um, just for those of you who, who weren't in touch with Fraunhofer Society, so Fraunhofer uh, is actually uh, dedicated to, to applied research. Uh, it consists of uh, about uh, 65 institutes that are distributed all over Germany, uh, doing applied research for different topics. And the institute I'm working for is the Institute for uh, Manufacturing, Engineering and Automation. So actually, we're dealing with uh, lots of different stuff that is somehow related to uh, to production and automation engineering. So uh, just some 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 facts and figures, maybe just to to get an overview. Um, we, we we have uh, around a thousand uh, industry related uh, projects each year. So quite quite a big institute. And of course, additive manufacturing is only one one small part, uh, one one of many topics, as you see here. Uh, just as an overview. Um, of those different things. So it starts, of course, with the things like uh, robotics and assistive systems, which you would probably imagine uh, for an institute uh, with, with the name that we have. But there are also some other topics like biomechatronic systems or lab automation, which is also um, a, a part of our institute. So it's quite a, a widespread uh, of, of different topics. And of course, it's uh, for, for me as as, uh, as the guy uh, for the additive manufacturing, it's also, let's say, a good playground to apply additive manufacturing in these different areas uh, the Institute is dealing with, actually. Um, so more specifically, um, uh, and this is then the last part of, of the introduction, um, just some words about what we're doing in the Department of Additive Manufacturing here at front of ITA. So maybe that's just maybe one information I should should give to you as well. So of course there are many other Fraunhofer institutes that are somehow dealing with additive manufacturing. So we are linked internally, and each institute has let's say a little bit different focus area. Um, so it's uh, uh, just just to avoid confusion on your side. Maybe you, you you know a lot of other guys from Fraunhofer Society dealing with additive manufacturing as well. So uh, it, it's quite a a big community inside Fraunhofer. So um, just to, to, to give you the motivation of what we're doing here at Fraunhofer IPA in the field of additive manufacturing, um, this is the, the timeline of the development of additive manufacturing. So um, don't, don't want to go into detail of what is, what is written here, but basically uh, just to illustrate one thing, the technology developed was started in 1983 and then let's say for about 20 years or even longer, it was only about uh, prototyping, about making models, not about really producing products. And this dramatically changed um, around maybe maybe 10 years, maybe 11 years ago. So since that, AM is really recognized as a manufacturing technology. And in that sense, it's a really young technology. And there are lots of uh, unsolved research, research questions. For example, um, things like how to automate, how to, to integrate the right functionality into the parts, how to make sure that the quality is really uh, solid and, and, and is reproducible. So, and all that stuff is actually um, giving us the motivation or let's say <clears throat> is, is the driver for all the research work that we are doing, uh, which we can summarize in this one sentence to say, we, we want to empower additive manufacturing for professional applications, bring them these technologies from rapid prototyping to the industrial shop floor. So a little bit more into detail. Um, so we are dealing, of course, with the additive core processes, but also with so-called hybrid processes. And this is especially um, well interesting, or I, I would I would say uh, we, those two examples are out of uh, the, the fields of hybrid processes that I will show you right now. The systems engineering and the industrialization, um, just just a, a brief look into these topics. So in the field of additive processes, we are uh, prelim preliminary uh, focused on, uh, on, on, photo, on, on polymer based um, systems and polymer based um, additive manufacturing method, methods that, that ranges from photopolymers until thermoplastics. And we're basically using all these processes that you can read here. Um, and actually we, we are really dealing with, with the improvement with uh, let's say uh, the, the tailoring and the the, the tweaking of these processes to, to make them, let's say, applicable to certain um, industrial applications here. What we call hybrid processes um, is, is, is uh, everything that is somehow a combination of 
uh, of additively uh, manufacturing methods and conventional or, or uh, complementary processes. For example, what you see here, it's an, an additively manufactured ceramic green body and it's uh, combined with assembly technologies, with soldering technologies to integrate these, these Sorry, Oliver, I cannot hear it currently. I can see you, I just cannot hear you. Well, you could, um, another possibility is that you could dial in via phone. Okay, another attempt, maybe you can hear me now. Perfect, great, fantastic, thank you so okay. much, yes. My apologies for that. So there was, was obviously a kind of network break because my, my IP phone on, on the desk was also crashed. So hope this will not uh, happen again in the next minutes. So I, I guess you, you, you got most of what I, what I was saying about hybrid processes. Um, um, and well, we, we will touch on that later on with the examples of, um, uh, of electronics, integration of electronics, systems engineering, uh, one very, very uh, relevant aspect for us, because if you develop uh, novel processes like these hybrid ones, then you always need to have the right printer at hand and probably no one wants to provide you that printer for what you, you are developing the process at the moment. So developing uh, the, the test tricks and even uh, equipment for our customers, that is uh, also one major part of our work. And last but not least, all these uh, different questions that are uh, uh, some, sometimes very uncomfortable, like uh, security questions, quality assurance, uh, developing of, of uh, tailored business models for these applications, and all that stuff, that is what we summarize under uh, the topic of industrialization, which is also one major role in our daily work. So that's just uh, the sorry, overview I think of what we're doing Oliver, sorry in, for at front of our IPA in the field of additive manufacturing. So now um, coming, coming to, to our motivation, why we think that 3D printing with electronic functionality is uh, part of the future, shall, should be part of the future in, um, uh, in, in additive manufacturing, actually. Oliver, excuse so, me. Would you Oliver, yeah. We are, your screen is not I need to get back to my slides as I had to adjust uh, Zoom <clears throat> and now here again. So starting with, uh, with, with, with the today's potentials of additive manufacturing. So basically, as I said, so AM technologies became state of the art for prototype manufacturing. That's, that, that's pretty clear. Uh, and it's currently underway to be exact as a high value manufacturing method for complex and for individualized products as well. Later. And as the technology develops, of course, there's also an increasing range of, of novel products and, and also business models, actually, that can be seen on the market even today um, that are exclusively based on the potential of AM. So there is no other way than, than using AM if you want to sell these products or if you want to, 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 to set up these kind of business models. And all that stuff, Later. like you see here, is actually possible. So it starts from, from things like medical devices, um, sunglasses, or also um, very technical things like in, in, in the aero engine stuff. Um, but what is not possible today, actually, or what, what is, uh, let's say, um, just, just um, based on the limitations that we have today, so there's no real functional integration 
um, possible in, in terms of electronics, uh, in terms of, let's say, sensorics or things like that. And all that is actually um, uh, quite, quite in contrast to what we see uh, these days talking about digitization, industry 4.0. Actually, all, all, all devices around us have some sensoric or electronic functionality integrated. And actually, that's just a, a logic consequence, in my point of view, uh, to empower AM technologies to make products with these electronic functionalities available as, as well in future. So that's, uh, in, in our point of view, one, let's say, a major development that, that, that we need to achieve to really empower additive manufacturing as a future production method, actually. And if, yeah, if, if we, we, we look at, at, at what, what is state of the art, if you want to, want to develop or want to produce um, components based on additive manufacturing or not that are somehow um, uh, based on, on uh, electronic functionality. So uh, on, on top here, you, you see maybe the, the, the classic example. Oliver, I'm so, so sorry yeah, to interrupt you, but we still cannot see your slides. I don't know if you hear me or to, not. To the ones that are, uh, but uh, no one can these, see the slides. Um, these, so sorry. These hearing ads, and then you have to manually assemble the electronics inside that. But that's actually not, not what, what we're considering as an industrial um, the process, of course. So <clears throat> that's the, the, the one uh, part of uh, what is state of the art. The other one, if you look at the, let's say, the, the conventional um, uh, production chains, um, if you want to, to, to manufacture a, let's say, electronic based product, you have very, very long and uh, somehow uh, fragile um, uh, delivery uh, ways, and you have, you have, you have um, yeah, production chains that are globally distributed, very time consuming. And actually, they are all adapted to huge lot sizes, about 100,000 plus items, which is, of course, uh, not suitable for, for a bunch of applications uh, that, that you cannot cover with, with, these, um, with these two approaches, actually. So there's just at the moment no sufficient 3D printing approach that uh, serves with the, let's say, flexibility and the freedom of additive manufacturing um, so that you can really apply that to, to electronic based systems actually. So. We just cannot see your there, slides, there sorry. I just change. needed to interrupt you. Yes, we, don't, we are not oh, able to see your so slides. Can you, we can hear can you and see you, we just cannot see the I slides. Need to share my screen again. Yes. So someone should give me a, a, a short uh, a short feedback if you can see my screen because I I've yes. seen that someone uh, ended my screen sharing. Yes, now we can see you. Can you hear us? So I can't hear none of you, unfortunately. So the question is, you, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Natalie or Jaim, can you give me short feedback? Yes. OK, thank you. So I'll just uh, go ahead. Sorry for that. So my network seems to, to, to crash sometimes. Okay, so that that's probably um, well quite, quite obvious, and 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 maybe you have to 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 apologize because these motivations you you might have heard in 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 other talks as well, uh, but but again that that's actually the, the the relevant basis for for our for our daily work, and this first example I want to show you is uh, actually a European funded project called Next Factory, and the, the long title was All in One Manufacturing Platform for System and Package and Micro Mechatronic Systems. Um, so actually, um, what we what we did in in that project um, uh, was, um, uh, or let's say, st starting at the mo motivation uh, to to say we want to simplify the manufacturing of electronic or micro mechatronic products based on the principles of additive manufacturing. So basically, of course, they, they, there are uh, possibilities, but but what what makes additive manufacturing so exciting is that you you just input the data and the raw materials and you get out the finished product. You have no tools, you know, have no ramp up times, and actually you, you, you are really flexible in design. You can do lot size one, actually. 
and to, 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 to set up a process that somehow is able to integrate electronics in, in, in the fashion that you, you're, you're used from, uh, from additive, let's say, or 3D printers, that is actually um, what, what, what was the, the, the vision of this next factory uh, project. So we said, okay, let's develop a hybrid pro manufacturing process that is based on additive manufacturing and on complementary processes that can be operated as one simple um, as just as uh, as a simple conventional 3D printer, um, so that you can can have kind of one-stop shop. So today in additive manufacturing, you have lots of service providers out there. You send your data file and you get back the part. And actually, this is just possible because it's a very very simple system. You just need the data and the raw materials, and and the printer does the rest actually. So you have all-in-one systems. Um, they are um, uh, well, um, very, uh, very flexible, so that you can customize your designs. You can do small lot, lot to large lots, and you are, let's say, service-centric. So there's one supplier you send the data, and you get you get back your um, your part. So you you you're not not in, in touch with a bunch of different uh, companies. Instead, you have really one one point of contact. So this is a little bit uh, in the direction of of. of of, of business models that 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 we we had the vision, um, but actually um, that that was the yeah the, the the vision of the project to to provide the technological basis um, to yeah to, to 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 set up a system a kind of printer system uh, that is um, that is able to to manufacture electronic based devices in that fashion actually. And um, of course, as I said, uh, so so it was clear additive manufacturing technology uh, technologies on on its own uh, will not be sufficient to uh, to to provide that complexity. And actually, in the talk before, we we already heard about all these different things like uh, assembly technologies and stuff like that, which is definitely necessary if you want to enhance the functionality. Uh, so that's actually what was the the, the 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 basis the basic assumption we we had at the beginning of the project to say okay if we set up such a manufacturing system it will consist of of course high precision um, uh, assembly technologies as one addition to to our um, freeform printing technologies in in the sense of additive manufacturing but uh, we need also uh, things like modeling and simulation optimization tools because um, reliability is really key for all these electronic systems and of course you can't print without the right materials so smart and functional materials for additive manufacturing processes was also one one, one major part of, of 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 this system actually and besides that which is quite usual for european projects we we try to demonstrate this technology based on three different use cases and also um, had had one one focus on on potential business models and manufacturing scenarios uh, in which you can operate such kind of system, which is of course completely different to to what is uh, what is established in electronic manufacturing today. So, of course, quite quite an interdisciplinary um, uh, topic, quite interdisciplinary uh, approach, and um, you see all the partners of this project here. So uh, we were the coordinators, but there was also uh, MicroSemi as a, a system in package man package manufacturer, um, other research partners in the field of um, uh, quality assurance and material development like Profactor and also Acreo, and there was Tiger Coatings as another. Um, uh, material provider, um, Celasis, Sunplugged uh, were the use case partners together with MicroSemi and um, we had Unity Technologies as, uh, as the company who did the machine integration. So uh, uh, lo lo quite an interdisciplinary project running for, uh, for four years. Um, and what, what came out actually was um, uh, quite, quite a mature machine, which uh, is some uh, something in between a manufacturing platform and a, let's say, research platform. Uh, so you see the, the, the picture here of the final machine. Um, as said, um, it, it was the intention to develop that machine in the fashion that you can operate it as just like a, a printer. Uh, but internally, of course, there's lots, lots more than only 3D printing. So we had, uh, or we have a uh, inkjet based um, 3D printing module, which can print with three different materials so that we can have uh, support material, 
dielectric material and conductive material. We have uh, a curing station, which is um, capable of doing uh, infrared, near infrared and UV curing. And we have an assembly and micro dispensing module. So we can assemble parts on one hand side of this module. And second, which is quite important, we can also uh, integrate dispensing steps so that we can um, additionally to, to the inkjet system use um, things like conductive pastes or, uh, or uh, glues as uh, it is state of the art in normal, let's say, SMD packaging at, the, at this time. And last not least, and very important to orchestrate all these, these different processes properly, we have a measurement inspection module which serves for, for quality inspection on the one hand side and also to, let's say, to orchestrate the processes to, to detect deviations during the build process and also to feed data to the simulation models, which, uh, which are somehow in the background, but, but still part of this uh, overall machine. So looking a little bit more in, in, into, in, into the, the technical details of this machine we developed. Um, so as said, uh, the intention was to, 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 to make it, uh, let's say, operable as one central machine. So uh, somehow we wanted to hide these uh, actually uh, these different processes from the user and give the user one unique interface where he can feed the data to. And um, so there is one HMI interface, which, which is actually um, uh, linked to all the process modules that, that can actually run the so-called manufacturing recipe. I'll touch on that later on the next slide and which controls the main access system. And then we have these four process modules uh, which implement those bespoke processes um, and that, that have, let's say, um, unified interfaces so that you can uh, you can exchange these modules so you could also plug in uh, other processes as well based on uh, standardized mechanical software and electrical interfaces um, and it's also um, let's say the, the complexity to control these uh, these uh, single processes is is covered uh, in in these in these modules so it's actually also possible to, to run these modules as a standalone module, which is especially important uh, in the development phase, of course. And um, yeah, then basically the, the idea is to have a kind of manufacturing recipe, which is fed to the main PLC. And um, it's, it's just a, a set of commands that are interpreted or that are forwarded to the modules and that are interpreted by the modules. And what happens is actually that um, for each manufacturing step in this, um, in this manufacturing recipe, um, the command is dispatched to one of the modules, which, which is able to, 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 to execute this, this command, like for example, uh, print one layer or uh, assemble uh, a set of, of, of components. And then this module becomes um, the, 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 the command over the access system can control the access system with the probe carrier executes the commands and gives back um, the control to the main plc and in that sense you can have uh, quite quite a, a complex uh, arrangement of different process steps that are all included in only this one manufacturing recipe which is of course linked with uh, a lot of um, uh, process specific data files uh, but in that sense, you, you have a really, really uh, easy to use interface to control this overall um, uh, yeah, manufacturing uh, process chain, which is integrated and, and uh, from, from a point of view of the user, yeah, operating just as one uh, holistic process, actually. So that's um, the, the machine part. So what we can do with that, uh, looking at the the the, the process uh, which is which is behind there, if you want to to integrate, uh, uh, let's say just in this example, very simple, uh, an SND resistor and a conducting track. So of course we print the support material at first <clears throat> to have a, a, a good adhesion to to our base carrier. Then we start printing with the dielectric ink, and we leave uh, these cavities for uh, this resistor on the one hand side and for the conductive track uh, on the other hand side. And then we can print with silver ink uh, the conductive track and in the cavity, we can place the component and dispense um, uh, non-conductive glue to fix the component. We use conductive glue to connect the component to this silver ink because bridging the gap between the part and, and the printed uh, dielectric would not be possible with silver ink. So that's the, one of the main reasons why we need these dispensing technologies in that, uh, in that um, 
overall process chain. And then we start measuring the topography. So if there would be deviations, and for sure there are deviations because of, of, of the, the assembly and the printing inaccuracy, which is uh, just, just uh, summarizing at a certain point. And we can react on these uh, surface topography by, by um, inkjet printing with the dielectric material uh, on locally selective uh, regions um, where this is necessary. And then um, we can go on with printing or uh, as, as illustrated here, we can also use the, the conductive glue to, um, to, to leave certain holes and to fill it with um, the conductive glue to, to realize um, some kind of wire structures in this process. But well, that's actually what, 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 what is implemented and what is possible with uh, this machine. You see the first test structures that we, we printed here. Uh, one of the first ones, and you, you see all the problems on that, uh, on that photo that, that can occur. So uh, of course, uh, quite challenging to adjust all the, um, the, different, um, uh, the different processes, like for example, uh, the, the, the knee infrared curing so that you have good conductivity, but, but no damage of your, of your uh, dielectric material, which is of course uh, quite crucial as well as the, 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 the displacement of the parts you see here, um, what, one of the first attempts, uh, not, not really uh, horizontally placed, but still functional. Um, and uh, you see in this um, yellow and this dark gray, um, the, the conductive glue uh, with uh, what this resistor is connected to these tracks on the side. And actually, um, of course, quite simple test structures. These were the first test ones, the, the, the first ones. Um, uh, after some improvement, uh, we were we were able to um, yeah to to do quite an exhaustive testing, which was done from Microsemi. So Microsemi really knows what to do when when talking about testing because they are dealing on a daily basis with uh, with uh, yeah conventionally manufactured system and package devices. And actually, they did a lot of, lot of testing, and actually. Um, all, all of these tests uh, could be uh, were survived from our test structures. Um, what, what we need to mention here is that uh, what is written here. So the problem is always um, if you want to connect such kind of uh, such kind of structure with the reflow process. So the dielectric material is able to to withstand this this reflow process, which was quite a, a big success because this is not so simple to achieve with uh, inkjet materials. But of course, you you need to have strategies on how to really um, electrically, electrically connect such a system to, for example, another PCB board because soldering uh, on these, um, let's say, silver pads would, would not be possible. All these silver pads would not survive that process. So you need to have some kind of discrete component as an interface uh, to, to, let's say, the, the, the outside um, of, of this system. So basically, that, that was um, uh, quite, a, quite a big success to, to be able to automatically manufacture such kind of structures. Of course, what is next? This is always, uh, let's say, uh, a kind of um, uh, traditional research projects. So there's uh, still uh, lots of work to do after project end. Um, so what we can do, as you see uh, uh, on these test structures, we can print such kind of test structures. And what we are um, doing at the moment is, of course, uh, further developing the overall machine, using it for increasing the complexity of products, trying new materials, and uh, adapting um, uh, this technology or this process chain to industry relevant use cases. And uh, I'm, I, I hope, I hope I, I'm, I'm allowed to, to, to say this. Uh, we're also partnering with, with Nanodyne I mentioned at the moment uh, to, to further develop that system or let's say to develop a, a system in, in the fashion of next factory together with Nano I mentioned. So that's uh, my, my first example. Um, so uh, the, the next one um, quite quite similar, but I would say uh, the, 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 the dimensions are, are a little bit bigger. Um, uh, we, we did that project with a uh, company, Aalborg, uh, company who uh, is expert in injection molding systems and uh, which has also developed uh, its own uh, additive manufacturing um, technology called Aalborg Plastic Freeforming and with the company Balu that you may know from, uh, from, from industry sensors, industries, industrial sensor technologies. And basically the question is, um, uh, how can we use um, uh, additive manufacturing to allow uh, the production of individualized sensors. So uh, 
it, it can start very simple. So standard uh, industrial sensors, such as proximity or distance sensors, have normally standard shapes, like uh, they are cylindric round um, uh, M12 or something like that. Um, and so it looks like a very simple component, but uh, still the integration uh, could be complex sometimes. So um, if you want to detect the target um, that is um, uh, that is um, uh, approaching the sensor, there are basically two ways to do it in an axial approach or in the lateral approach. Um, seems to be um, as this could be really done with standard components. But if you look at that, um, the second, the lateral approach target, um, sometimes you don't have the build space to, to use a, a, a normal, a conventional sensor. Um, so you, you have uh, qu quite, uh, quite strong restrictions in terms of, of, of build space that you're consuming in such an arrangement. And it gets even worse if you think about uh, things like, again, from, uh, from, from the field of uh, automation engineering, if you have such kind of gripper device and you want to detect um, if there is a, a product to grip uh, which is really uh, an application which is um, uh, well i would say quite quite typical for 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 automation technologies um, it's it's really difficult to integrate a sensor directly in that gripper but but actually that would be the, the optimum case to to really directly um, detect if there's a product on the gripper finger so so you really have the problem there is no standard sensor available that you could uh, uh, integrate in such such kind of of gripping device but of course, um, it's quite quite an easy thing to do to to print such a a a, a, a gripper finger, and this is something which is I would say um, uh, for for many applications state of the art today. So what is actually missing is the possibility to integrate the sensoric functionality uh, in this printed gripper finger. So actually, that that was the um, uh, let's say the the approach um, or, the, or the the question. Um, uh, can we can we develop a process that 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 serves the need of industrial applications for customized packages, still on the base of uh, based on the functionality uh, from standard electronic sensor or from standard electronic components? As said, this 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 uh, is let's say maybe one um, one uh, dimensional. Uh, size larger than, than what I've shown you in the next factory process, but still quite demanding uh, manufacturing requirements. So on the one hand side, uh, of course, um, we need to, to, to be able to print multi-materials, but we are restricted to specific polymer materials that, that are certified for, for these um, uh, applications in, in industrial environments. We have high qualification standards, of course, and um, uh, cost is always a matter. Uh, when, when talking about uh, such kind of um, applications, high availability, high availability, of course. And specifically for this industrial production process, um, uh, the, the so-called PBT um, material um, is, is the one which is, um, uh, yeah, the, I would say one of the standard materials um, to injection mold um, such kind of sensor systems like a proximity sensor. Um, and the, the approach or the one requirement um, was to, to really use this original material and not to, to mitigate to, to another material, which is, uh, for example, tailored for, for other additive manufacturing methods. And this is exactly why um, we, we use this uh, arbor plastic reforming um, uh, technology, because uh, this technology is really able to, to use the same materials as you're used um, from injection molding. Of course, you need to, to do a lot of process development and process tweaking, but right at the end, um, you are able to, to use this, uh, this, uh, the same materials as you, you have for injection molding. Of course, on the other hand side, um, again, we are ending up with a kind of hybrid manufacturing process uh, because only using this elbow plastic reforming would of course not, uh, not be sufficient to integrate the desired functionality to integrate PCB boards or discrete components. So um, what, what we did uh, just um, 
uh, to come from from that standard sensor as you can buy from company Ballo, for example um, to to an individualized one so to say we removed uh, the metal housing we separated the electronic components and we we, we uh, designed an application specific three-dimensional layout for the electronic components and we integrated these electronic components into into a individualized pbt housing um, and of course, made the electric connection inside this PBT packaging. So that's uh, kind kind of uh, uh, yeah view to the to the inside of such kind of sensor. So this is this lengthy uh, PCB board, which is of course tailored to um, the, the the outer dimension of such a sensor. And you have this call detector right in front of that, which is actually the the, the, the main or the, the relevant device which you have to, to place on the right spot to detect your, your parts actually. And of course, both the coil and the, the PCB port and the connectors need to be connected properly. So in our, uh, in, in our um, uh, example, a very simple one, we just wanted to, to change the orientation of our uh, call detector. Um, uh, turn it uh, uh, for 90 degrees and um, place it a little bit outside of the, the, the middle axis of the sensor. So that is actually what, 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 what was the, let's say, the, the demonstrator package uh, we, we, we used to, to develop this process, which I will show you now. Again, quite similar to, to what, we, what we did in the next factory case, but uh, we don't have this, this, this integrated process chain. Instead, we used uh, different, let's say, standalone processes to, um, to, to achieve uh, the final result. Actually, it starts again with printing of the main body and uh, of some insert parts, or let's say the, 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 the first part of the main body. And then second, we, we integrated the coil into this insert right in front of that. So this coil is um, already um, assembled, pre-assembled, uh, is placed inside um, that cavity here. Then um, we continue the printing process of the base body, but we leave certain, certain holes here, as you can, as you can see. Uh, those those holes are um, uh, yeah a, a kind of preliminary step for for making the vias the via connection to these um, coil connector pads here. And then after um, after having this uh, this this insert printed, we go on printing uh, and leave out certain cavities to to place the PCB board and to dispense uh, the conducting tracks. So at this point, we're using dispensing technologies um, to 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 make the conducting tracks instead of inkjet printing. And the reason behind that is that we have quite quite a quite a rough surface of this PBT printed structure. You will see that on the pictures right now. Um, so that inkjet printing would not suffice, or let's say that the normal uh, inkjet silver ink is just um, uh, not, 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 not viscous enough so that we, we can have a proper uh, connectivity here. And after um, um, integrating this, um, this PCB board, um, we, we, we do, as I said, the, um, the, the dispensing of the, the silver ink, um, also use the silver ink to connect this coil in front of it. And after sintering, which is not mentioned here, um, we, we go on uh, with uh, printing the, the, the upper part of our housing so that finally we have a, a fully um, packaged uh, sensor um, with a PPT housing. Here again, some, um, some uh, sectional uh, view of uh, the final result of this um, printed and uh, assembled sensor. I already that, uh, said that, so this was a, a joint venture between company Arbok, who, um, who provided the Arbok plastic freeforming technology, who selected the materials and, and the application specific materials, and who did the system and process development together with us. So we, we, we took care for the printing process of the PPT material. We integrated the conductive structures, the strategies on how to, to, to use the dispensing technologies on these kind of surfaces. And we uh, also um, uh, partnered with company Balov in the design and manufacture of these demonstrators. And company Balov, of course, um, uh, provided the sensors and, and the electronic components um, and uh, developed with us the encapsulation and the sealing technologies and did the industrial qualification. So that was actually the setup. And um, 
basically, of course, um, for company valve, this could be one, one use case for future applications, uh, not only to, to sell standard sensors and but um, selling really, um, let's say, application specific sensors that can probably be designed or let's say tailored by the customers to their needs. Just some, um, some uh, small uh, looks on, 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 on uh, the single process steps. As you see here, this is the first uh, up lower part of this PPT housing. And because of this infill structure, um, you see that you have quite a, let's say, um, yeah, rough surface in, in these regions where we uh, applied uh, the, the, the conducting glue. We changed the, 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 the process or the, the printing strategy so that we had uh, a smooth surface, but still this is not sufficient for inkjet printing. Um, so that's what, what I'll tell you later on. So here, just uh, for, for those who are not familiar with this technology, um, this is a, um, a short sketch about this alloplastic free-forming process. So you have the raw material, which is just um, a standard granulate as you, 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 can, you can buy for injection molding processes. You have the material conditioning uh, in the fashion of, of, of classic injection molding technologies with a screw extruder. So the material reservoir at front of this screw is uh, under high pressure. And then you have a piezo based um, nozzle valve, um, which, which can, can open and close in a very, very fast cycle and can inject uh, these small um, plastic droplets. Um, here and can deposit it on, on the surface. So you can, uh, in, in that fashion, build up your three-dimensional part out of um, standard thermoplastic materials based on, on small droplets. Of course, you can also uh, do that with multi-material structures, but, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's made for, 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 for a wide range of thermoplastic materials not for uh, things like, uh, like uh, pastes or like, um, like conducting pastes. And therefore, of course, we, we, we use different technologies to integrate the electronic components to make the, uh, to make the, the, the tracks. Just some, uh, some small spotlight on, 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 the, on the crucial parts of, um, uh, of what happens if you integrate or try to connect these, um, these conducting tracks to your components. Um, so what you see here is actually the case that you want to connect, uh, make the connection from bottom side. So that means um, you, you have, uh, you, you, you have your, your conducting track and you want to, to connect your PCB board or your sensor device from bottom side. So you, at first you have to place a, a droplet of conducting glue, then you, you need to place um, the PCB board on top of it. You see it here. So here's the, the droplet of uh, conductive glue. Then you place the PCB component on top of that. And then uh, during the sintering process, uh, the, the, the final conductive connection is made. And actually, um, the, the, the tricky thing is to, to really find the correct dosing, to, to have the right geometries of your cavities underneath. And what you see here, you can have underdosing, you can have overdosing. So underdosing, nothing will happen. Overdosing, uh, you will have a short circuit. And if you have the, 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 right, the right design of your, um, of your cavities and the right dosing strategy, you finally get a, a really reliable process uh, to connect uh, PCB boards reliably to, to such a printed structure. The other way around, um, if you have the connection on top of that, um, the gap between uh, your printed part, the PPT housing, and your PCB board is actually the critical spot. You need to have the right accuracy, uh, the, the right um, um, process parameters so that you can make sure that this gap between PCB board and printed structure is small enough so that you can reliably connect to your, um, to your uh, printed uh, or to your PCB board with your uh, connection pads. So two examples in the closer look. Uh, so as you see here, if the gap is too small, uh, you can't bridge it with the normal um, silver silver paste. Um, I should mention here that these silver pastes are not specifically developed. They are just um, off the shelf uh, silver paste as you can also uh, use for, or also buy for conventional um, electronic systems. Of course, testing qualification. Quite important uh, uh, issue to, uh, to, to estimate uh, uh, your results. Uh, as you see here, we, we made lots of different sensors to, to really have uh, 
in enough cycles um, for testing. Um, sorry for not, not having translated this. Um, so uh, just, uh, of course, the, the normal um, electromagnetic um, uh, distortion uh, checks, uh, mechanic vibration um, and shock testing, um, cable testing, um, uh, then, of course, uh, temperature change tests and all uh, these, the, these tests that are, I would say, um, yeah, uh, the, 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 the state of the art for, for such kind of sensors um, were executed and most of these tests um, or most of these sensors survived. Of course, uh, the process was uh, in parts manually. So we have, of course, deviations and uh, because of these deviations, some of the sensors did not survive. But basically, we can, we can say that um, we are able to print such kind of sensors in this uh, process chain. Um, that, that can survive the, the normal standard test methods as they are also used for uh, conventional sensors that you can buy off the shelf today. Yeah, and then, which is actually my, my final slide, um, uh, leaving the examples, um, just one thought about uh, what will happen in future about additive manufacturing. I thought this is quite a, quite a suitable comparison as we're talking about electronics here. So what you see here is the five megabyte hard disk drive in the year, year 1956 and uh, the one terabyte micro SD card in the year 2020. So quite, quite a rapid development and well, additive manufacturing started 30 years later. So the question to raise would be where will it be in 2050? And I'm pretty sure that integrating uh, functionalities uh, like sensors or electronic functionality will be definitely state of the art in, in less than 30 years. So that's it from my side. Uh, thanks for listening and happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Oliver, thank you for this enlightening presentation. And uh, questions are arriving here. I have one here. problem because I, I, I can't hear you. I, I try to fix that. Um, hopefully this will, will, will work. Um, just give me one second. I think okay. so. I think it's your Bluetooth connection. Yeah, the yeah. Jabra. It was just Zoom, which which did which which always recognizes the wrong microphone. But now I can hear you. Okay, okay great. So the first question we have: a, What is the throughput the capability of the machine, the machine that you guys develop? I think it, it this points on, on on the next factory system. So at the moment the throughput is is quite low because it's it's developed as a kind of um, a lab platform. But these different modules can be used um, in, in other setups uh, so that they can be operated in parallel. At the moment, only one process can, uh, can work at a time. But this can be parallelized. And in that sense, uh, the, the throughput can be scaled, actually. So for the time being, it's, 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 it's quite a slow lab platform. Um, I would say it takes, takes about, let's say, uh, uh, maybe two to three hours to build up a, a, a simple test structure, which is as said, um, because of, of the tailoring of the machine to, to the needs of, of, of lab scale. Okay, the other question that is probably related to this as well, to some extent is, uh, are the time that the modules spend on each, uh, the time that the print job spends on each module the same, or it varies from module to module? Exactly. So the, these are three different, four different modules that are implementing four different processes. So the, this varies. Yeah. Okay. So the time spent on each module is in the is separate, is different, right? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That that's right. And and this is also the reason why it would be uh, uh, very reasonable to parallelize these these modules and maybe also to implement different numbers of these modules in in a real industrial setup because curing takes for example, a lot longer than printing and assembly is a different matter as well. Okay. Um, you said you, you talk about the inserted resistors uh, that then you connected with uh, silver epoxy or other methods. What about printed resistors? Yeah, that's just a different approach. Of course, you can also print resistors, but, but the question is why not buying those resistors or those components that are established, that are used uh, for, 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 for the potential um, uh, yeah, technology providers. 
of course, we can print resistors, but um, the approach was just to make use of those technologies that are on market and to use them within an additively manufactured process chain. Okay. Um, a question just came in, it says, in the Arbor plastic uh, freeform, why is the material conditioning done in the fashion of injection molding rather than extrusion? Well, the, the, the principle or, or what the, the, let's say the advantage is if you have a normal, um, let's say FLM based printer, you need to, to precondition your material in, uh, as a filament. So you need to, to feed filaments um, to, your, um, to your printer and you don't have, um, let's say the possibility to, to directly operate on, on, on pellets actually. And the overall process, um, setup is, is just similar to a injection molding process, which again, um, gives the opportunity to, to, to work with uh, those materials that are tailored to um, injection molding processes. And most of the plastic materials are tailored to injection molding. Okay, uh, one more question here. Um... Have you compared the cost of uh, using this uh, the additive manufacturing for these components to conventional methods? And uh, how do you see the cost uh, in 2030, not that far as 2050? That's a good question. So I, I, I definitely the, the costs are a lot higher today. But the question is if you if if you if you want to produce a product and you don't have uh, the, the traditional method available that can serve to, 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 to manufacture that product, for example, because it's not tailored to the lot sizes that you need, because you, you only need some, some hundreds a year and not 10,000s. So then the question is, what, what is the right way to compare uh, manufacturing costs between these two completely different manufacturing scenarios? Okay. And uh... The last question here uh, that has arrived is what will be the <clears throat> what will be the sorry I'm trying to read it here yeah do you think that the manufacturing in volume of the with uh, this type of technology will be sooner than 2000, that 2050 I think yes so the question is what what, will, volume? Sorry, what will take for to, to achieve that I, I think they, at first they, they, there needs to be uh, the market demand because uh, today all, all the engineers have in mind the, the, the classic production methods as soon as they recognize that there is some, something else which, which might be able to, to, to do better for certain applications, then I think there's a market need and then there will be companies who, who take over such kind of technologies to further develop. And, and then things normally go quite fast. Okay, and another question that now is more on the performance of these devices, especially in the RF area. How is the roughness of the conductive surfaces and what are the realistic frequencies and power limits for, for this? The question is what, what, um, if, if this is pointing at the first or the second um, use case or, or, or project example, of course, in the next factory uh, use case, you have very smooth surfaces um, because of the inkjet printed um, dielectric and, and you have very thin layers of silver ink. So it's actually um, what, what is state of the art for inkjet based um, silver inks or silver ink printing. In the other um, case, of course, you have this, this rough surface in the inner part of, of your PVT housing. So uh, your, your, your RF um, capabilities are definitely limited at that point. So we, we thought about um, making um, uh, further process steps. So to, to, to have some kind of intermediate layer to, 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 to give a smooth surface uh, so that you also have, uh, let's say, a smooth conductive track. But we did not um, until now in this project. Okay, and then another question that also just arrived here, uh, reading it. Uh, do, did you have any problems on the deformation of the plastic uh, when you deposit the traces uh, due to the difference on the, the thermal, the, cap, the CTE? Yeah, definitely. So, so I have shown the, the, this 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 picture of one of our first test structures, which, which was completely deformed, and you 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 you've seen all the shrink shrinkage of 
of the conducting track. So of, yes, th this is definitely a problem and, and, and tailoring, um, let's say materials as well as uh, the curing methods, uh, the, the curing strategies is key if you, if you want to, to avoid deformation. Okay, and uh, how do you control the quality of the printed part? And what are the key areas that need to be monitored? Sorry, there was just a noise. Can you repeat, please? Yes. How do you control the quality of the printed part and what are the key areas that you think okay. need to be monitored? Actually, in, in, in this, um, we, we, we had integrated a 3D, uh, 3D um, uh, measurement system, camera-based uh, uh, surface topology measurement. So we can, we can control the topology or measure the control topology of each printed layer on the one hand side. We can also um, estimate the, um, the volume of the cavities um, and we can, uh, we can distinguish between the materials of silver ink and um, dielectric ink. Uh, and in that, that sense, we have, let's say, the, the geometric data um, of each printed layer. And at the end, of course, th this is something we, we, we do not control at the moment inside the process. This is the, the conductivity of the tracks. This is something um, we can only measure um, after the process. And with the 3D camera, if you see a deviation from the expected value, do you adjust the printing to accommodate for compensate for that? Yes, this this is actually uh, what what is uh, what, what was foreseen in the system, so that you can uh, derive from the measured surface topology a kind of let's say um, intermediate um, print pattern that you can uh, print with your dielectric ink, so that you can uh, compensate uh, a certain surface roughness. Okay, great. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions here. Uh, so Oliver, thank you very much for your question, your representation and the, the answer to the questions and uh, in forward in further developments with, uh, at Frank Hofer. Thank you. And my apologies for the technical uh, interruptions. Sorry for that. Well, things happen and we understand that. Okay, with this, uh, Natalie, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Chaim. Thank you, Oliver. This was a really great, Great presentation, and we're really excited to have you on board. Um, just again to update and inform people, please, or for everyone who just joined and did not um, was not there right from the beginning, please any questions posed, do not post them in the chat. Um, put them in the Q and A, and we'll make sure to follow up with them. Also, just to ensure everyone, the recording will be available at ane-academy.com. So. Um, once we will finalize this um, seminar, we will be sharing it via email to anyone who has registered and then also be posting this recording to the website. So our next presenter um, is from the DEFCOM Army Research Laboratory. It's Jian Zhu. I don't know if Jian Zhu is already available, if he could come online, share his screen. Yeah, can you hear? Yes, perfect, okay. fantastic. Good morning, um, everyone. Just, yeah. Yeah. Let me share my screen, see if it works. Perfect. I'm just going to, we know that your video is not working so that people um, are not questioning or asking why you're not showing yourself. We do know due to some security measures that um, showing or sharing your um, yeah, personal that's right. screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the uh, my slides? Yes. Great. Okay. Let me, move, let me move them. See if it can move. Good. Moving? Yes, perfect, okay. fantastic, All thank right. you. I can wait until the exact time, 12.30, right? Well, I believe we can just go ahead and move forward. Um, since there is the recording, um, if people have any questions, they will be able to um, send them directly to you. So if any questions or if people have missed out or don't feel like we have answered the questions, um, please do forward them to the Amy Academy and we'll forward those questions to the speakers personally. Okay. I would just please go ahead, Jen. I think. Um, okay. All right. I will go ahead then. All right. Thank you. So yeah, my name is uh, Jen Yu. I am um, a current I, uh, material engineer with the um, Development uh, Combat Command at the uh, Army Research Laboratory, United States. So today I'm gonna ha present some of my um, researches in 3D hybrid electronics additive manufacturing at 
our lab, uh, our research laboratory. Uh, before I begin, I, uh, this is my disclaimer. So I'm not uh, here to endorse any uh, a commercial product. Um, uh, sub the view and opinion of um, of my presentation is uh, my own and it may not reflect that of the United States government, nor the Department of DOD, nor the uh, Department of Army. So I just want to share some of the, my personal view and present what I know on uh, what I'm doing on uh, 3D uh, printable electronics. Here's my uh, presentation outline. I'm going to give this uh, a brief uh, presentation on uh, what the Army Research Lab Laboratory is and I'll go on to about uh, additive manufacturing in general at, uh, at our laboratory. And lastly, I present some of the example uh, that I'm uh, involved in, in terms of uh, printed uh, hybrid electronics. And uh, I will end with the question and answer uh, session. So the, the Army Research Laboratory is uh, quite large. Um, my, uh, my post is at the Abingdon Proving Ground in, in Maryland. And we also have uh, several different uh, sites across the uh, country in the United States. Some, uh, some of our uh, colleagues are actually headquartered with uh, some universities, like uh, Northeastern University in Boston, University of Texas at Austin, and uh, University of Chicago at, in Chicago, and as well as uh, Stanford in uh, California. And also, I listed some of the sources. If you want to learn more about it, I have uh, links at the bottom of my presentation. You can always uh, go to the link and visit. Uh, they are open and unclassified, so everyone can access to this, this information. So what, what the Army Research uh, uh, Laboratory do? Well, we are the United States premier uh, laboratory for the land forces. So anything to do with the army, the soldiers, we do it. Um, we particularly uh, do uh, very basic, what, what we call 6-1 uh, basic fundamental researches. Uh, and then we can, we also do uh, applied science research. That's a little bit more mature in terms of technology. And we've advanced that uh, science and the process, and we we uh, partner up with a private corporation, and we we, br we will bring that product to the soldier and deploy in the field. So we basically we cover our research cover from anywhere from uh, computer sciences, you know, ballistic science, propulsion, protection, and materials and uh, manufacturing uh, researches. In terms of uh, uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, um, the Army already invested a, quite a huge uh, uh, amount of uh, time and energy and money in this area. We, we actually started uh, a decade ago with the uh, Rapid uh, Expeditionary Force uh, Laboratory. What we have is a, a Connex filled with uh, 3D printing uh, printers uh, with uh, capability of machining, molding, uh, and rapid development. So in the field, we, we deployed this uh, unit actually in Afghanistan uh, in the past, uh, where, where the soldier can actually come in and they can prototype and design anything that they want, that they need uh, in terms of uh, a tool set or even a drone. So the, the photos I show here is a, a printed drone, except the electronics part, of course. The electronic part, we kind of let the soldier uh, sample all the uh, components together, but the the drone's body are, are, are 3D printed. And uh, well, the photo on the right is uh, actually a grenade launcher that we, pr we printed. So yeah, the whole thing actually is printed, um, just including the uh, aluminum frames, the plastic handle, minus the ammunition. The ammunition is still the, you know, the standard grenade. So actually, it's a functional uh, piece of a uh, uh, grenade launcher. Right. 
And recently, the Army have a uh, uh, what we call a, a Army modernization priority. So what we want to do is we want to modernize our uh, land forces for the upcoming uh, uh, or future potential com uh, conflicts. This in this uh, uh, modernization priority is called a uh, uh, wrong range precision fire. So what we intend to do is if we want to have a, a, a capability where we can act actually penetrate uh, and defeat uh, potential adversaries uh, defense. Uh, and we want to del deliver, uh, you know, more, de more de lethal uh, warheads, uh, faster, uh, longer range. And uh, should be a very, very capable of uh, both uh, interdiction as well as evading uh, radar detections. So this is kind of an um, area that I'm, I'm currently in, involved with. So uh, we have a, currently we have a program where we want to do is uh, we want to 3D print the whole uh, missile. So what I'm showing here is a, uh, a schematic uh, of different types of uh, additive manufacturing that we are doing right now, research uh, at, the, at the research uh, uh, phase. So we, one is uh, energetic additive manufacturing, where we want to print the energetic for propulsion as well uh, for uh, lethality. So why we want to print the uh, energetics? Well, uh, right now the current technology is that you can extrude a uh, energetic into like a cylinder. You know, it, it can burn, yeah, but the efficiency is not there. So in in, in three D printing, yet you, you can actually tailor the shape of the burn profile to make it more efficient and make it more lethal as well. Next is the metal additive manufacturing, where we uh, try to three uh, D print the body for light weighting for uh, survivability, and also has a uh, fragmentation. You know, once again, we focus on the lethality of the missile. And finally, uh, the 3D uh, uh, electronic printing part, uh, which I, I'm involved in. So that's involved in, in terms of how you uh, uh, 3D print a uh, certain fusing guidance system or communication system. You know, just make it smaller, lighter, so that you, you don't waste enough, uh, you don't waste space on, on, on this kind of a, a navigation system so that you can carry a, a better uh, uh, warheads, basically. So that's why I'll kind of give you some example that uh, I've been working on. So in my laboratory, uh, we have a full array of different types of uh, additive uh, manufacturing machine. You know, the Dragonfly, everyone knows now. Uh, we also have Enscript and uh, Optimac uh, aerosol jet. We have an inject printing, a paste printer. So we kind of combine different material, we combine different techniques, and we make a product that uh, uh, that will, that is 3D uh, structural electronic components. Now I'm going to give you some example of what uh, what I've been doing uh, with the printed electronics, uh, specifically uh, using the, uh, the Dragonfly uh, Pro. So this is a project uh, with the uh, the Five Eyes. So this the international cooperation with the alliance, you know, Canada, Britain, New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. So in this project, we want to uh, come up with a, uh, a, a configurable uh, wideband uh, frequency uh, control antenna that is multi-functional uh, and it can be integrated into uh, different types of structure like uh, airfoil, a helmet, um, uh, a, a antenna on the roof of uh, a vehicle. So um, the the picture show here is actually printed by the uh, by the uh, dragonfly. So it was directly printed on a uh, on a composite substrate, and subsequently uh, we consolidated and center it. So this is a silver print, and we measure the performance, and actually it meets the uh, the design criteria. So this is a very uh, rapid turnaround for us because we, so we, uh, 
from design to actually realization of this project is, you know, took like less than three months to, to do it. So we are very excited that we can use uh, uh, you know, additive manufacturing technique to uh, speed up our, uh, our research and as well as uh, prototyping the stage. Um, this is another sam example that, uh, uh, that we use uh, the Dragonfly, the LDM uh, version of it uh, to print our GPS antenna for guidance. So we know the, the property of the ink and the property of the printed uh, uh, substrate. And from that, we can actually uh, design a, a GPS antenna specifically according to those uh, material properties. So when, when we measure the, uh, the performance, actually it's pretty close to, to our design criteria. So what we're able to do is that we, we, we can use a, a a well-known analytical design to tailor made a GPS patch antenna. And we were able to rapidly design and manufacture the antenna, you know, almost for any uh, frequency here or configuration. And we don't have to tune it uh, manually at, at the end of the day. So we save a lot of time on uh, a tuning. Um, so this is a very uh, uh, rapid process for us and we were very happy with the result. So the next example is a uh, reverse engineering of a legacy PC board, a PCB board. Um, so the army is a very old, and we have equipment that you know date back to the Vietnam era, and we still have those uh, le legacy system uh, in use because uh, they look so well, and we don't want to get rid of them. And sometimes you know uh, a PCB board can burn out, and the original manufacturer may not supply them anymore. So and then we don't have the uh, the join or the electrical uh, connection. Or, uh, so we want to uh, reverse engineer a, uh, a burnout board. So what we do is uh, we we uh, use the uh, X-ray uh, XCT or X-ray chromatography to uh, scan the board, and we kind of re uh, retrofitted all the um, or reconstructed all the traces and all the uh, signal uh, layers, and we kind of do a, a Gilbert reconstruction, and from that. We, we, we feed it into the the dragonfly and it will do the processing and we kind of do a one-to-one -one, uh, reverse engineer uh, PCB board. So we kind of develop a workflow and testing and actually we, uh, we successfully uh, replicate a, uh, a PCB board you know, within a week of work. So it's a huge amount of saving and labor uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, uh, figured out you know what the pc board does and try to uh as a a third, uh, a third party um pc board uh manufacturer to do something like that for us because we, we just need one or two we we're not you know making hundreds of these so it's very extremely efficient for us and lastly um we, we're currently doing a conformal printing uh to it, for enhanced uh, sensor dome for targeted navigation. So we want to actually, we want to put the circuit on the structure itself. So, so that to save, uh, to save space and uh, save energy and volume as well. So we get uh, uh, more room for the payload. Um, so here, an example I show is uh, one of the uh, 2D circuit we printed uh, for a sensor package. So this is also a, a, a Dragonfly uh, product. So eventually we want to uh, bring this uh, 2D into a 3D world. And uh, we, we definitely uh, are going down the right path in terms of uh, the prototypes and, uh, and the manufacturing uh, f uh, flow work. So I'm very excited in, in, in this field right now because uh, it, the, the additive manufacturing of electronic is uh, in, in great swing. And then there's a momentum that going forward to, to advance the art. Uh, of additive manufacturing. And lastly, of, of course, uh, we also develop uh, the material uh, for the printing as well. So we, we develop our own uh, silver ink solution as well as copper ink solution. You know, we, we develop different kind of morphology for extrusion-based additive manufacturing as well as for jetting, such as the, um, the Dragonfly, the aerosol jets. Uh, so for extrusion, we develop uh, ink for the um, uh, end script as well. 
So, yep, this is my presentation. So I will uh, open for any question if you have. Jan, Ellie. Okay, okay, Jan. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we have uh, so, some questions here. The in a couple of questions are repeated from different people, so I'll, I'll just uh, consolidate them. Um, how do these uh, IoT manufacturing electronic devices qualify at DevCon, and do they apply to any device? So, uh, in our research laboratory, we're doing the basic fundamental of it. So we're not looking to substitute the current technology. We are well, basically we're working out the workflow and how we uh, can qualify and quantify uh, the product and eventually how we can uh, do it in the field. So we are at the stage of just the fundamental uh, research part right now. So we're not particularly saying we're going to do this for real. We just do explore, uh, more of an exploratory scientific study. Okay, so do you have any, so you don't uh, specify any vibration, uh, humidity, and any of those standards uh, capability range for the performance of these devices? In terms of performance, uh, well, we, 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 we have all, uh, you know, the mil spec standards. So is, is that the co a question? Is that what, what kind of standard we use to test? Uh, yeah, basically, I'm just trying to summarize uh, these questions in different format for the same uh, the same type of question that come from different attendees. So that's the question, correct? Okay. Yeah, I see the the other standard requirement. Yeah. So so some of the standard we use is the mil spec standard, like environmental standard. Uh, some of the uh, uh, standard in terms of uh, survivability, like the 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 G loading forces. Um, so the standard is out there. So you, you can actually look up the mil spec for all the electronics. Yeah, but the question is if you have tested this, uh, the antennas as well as the other circuits like the reverse engineer board, uh, mm -hmm. those the standards. Okay. So uh, some of the uh, the printer antenna by Nano uh, Dragonfly uh, printer, we, we, we did a, uh, a G-Shock test. So that we, we show that the, it, it can survive, uh, you know, 15 kilo G, basically. So that's what one of our criteria to look at. It's very specific to the system, right? So for the antenna, we, we tested at uh, 15 kilo. I think we lost him. Jan? Uh, temperature, well, it, it can survive the temperature as well. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, we lost you in the connection for a, for a, the last two sentences. Can you repeat them, please? Oh, in, in terms of temperature survival, yeah, the the the, the nano uh, dimension printer, uh, the product, you know, it, it survived the high temperature, you know, seventy degrees C test. Yes. Okay. Um, and the other question that you asked me in is, or yeah, is. Um, you said that you were able to save time by the additive manufacturing process. Um, do you, uh, how, how much time you save compared to the non-additive manufacturing process? Okay, so in, in terms of the, uh, for example, the uh, reverse engineering part, right? Yeah. So we, we only took a week. Was, yeah. In that case as well as the other one that you discussed earlier that uh, took about two months to do it, otherwise it would have taken yeah. longer. Yeah. So yeah. So the the reverse engineering one is very rapid for us. A one week turnaround time from from the beginning. Look at the chips, and then we do X ray, and then we do the rever uh, the Gilbert file, draw it up, and then print. It takes uh it takes a you know less than less than a day to print, and then we do another day of testing. So yeah, it takes one week if we go this route. But if we go the wrong route, I mean, we probably takes another extra two to three weeks because uh, the, the, the printing capability, we had to go outside if we don't have the uh, additive manufacturing capability. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I don't have any more questions that have arrived. Uh, so Jan, thank you very much for the presentation and, uh, and um, we're going to move forward. So Natalie, back to you. Thank you, Hi. Hi, Eric. Hey, how are you guys? Can you hear me? 
Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. So our next presenter is Dr. Eric McDonald. Thank you for joining us so early. I know um, time-wise we moved up um, quite a bit over here. I was thinking maybe we can just run a quick poll and you can um, get comfortable and set up your setting. Um, and then we can just get some feedback from the audience for now. Chaim, would you want to turn off your video right now and later on? Perfect. So I'm just going to run a quick poll. So for everyone who is joining us today, um, it would be great if you could answer um, the three questions that you posted that you see posted on your screen, just for us to get a better understanding um, on what we should be focusing on at the AME Academy, what you want, what you want to learn, what presenters you would like to see um, in the future. And um, yeah, it just helps us to develop content and um, get speakers on board that you might want to see and uh, hear more about. But in the meantime, um, Eric, how are you? Can you? Uh... Yeah, so I actually, I don't see your questions. You said they were on the oh, screen. Oh, you don't? Oh, wait, now? Okay, yeah, all right. Fantastic, so sorry, thank no. you. So would you go ahead and explain a little bit about the University of Texas, El Paso, and what you guys do and how you came? Sure. sure. Do you want me to start in the presentation? I think I kind of cover it a little bit throughout this. Um, or are we waiting for the designated time? Well, no, we're just going to give it five more minutes, and then we will continue okay. to let you present. Yeah. Well, so just to give you a little background, I'll probably, I hope I don't repeat this later, but I got slides that sort of show where I'm at and where I've been, but I've been working on 3D printing, um, really what I would call multifunctionality, but to be honest, it's really 3D printed electronics. Um, but I do include other things in that, like thermal management and actuation and things like that. Uh, but I was at the University of Texas at El Paso uh, from 2003 to 2016, and in about 2004 started working on using bat photopolymerization, interrupting the process and including other components, electronics, conductive inks to make electronics. Um, and of course that was long before it sort of hit, hit popular culture, 3D printing, you know, which I think would be more like the 2011, 2012 timeframe. So I was kind of in additive before it was cool. And then, um, and then when, in that time frame in 2011, you know, where President Obama even talked about additive manufacturing in the State of the Union, and it, it, it was capturing the imaginations of, you know, the general public, you know, we had about a decade of work almost at that point of doing some pretty um, wacky kind of ideas, trying to find different applications that could benefit from additive. And it sort of took off. And at that time, and you can see the logo at the bottom here, America Makes, uh, this is an institute that Obama started back, I guess, in 2012, 2013. It's a Fraunhofer-inspired uh, institute. There's actually a network of institutes in manufacturing in the United States. And this was the first one. And it's in Youngstown, uh, which is a city that is in between Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Ohio. And so at UTEP, we got a lot of funding from them. I ended up going up there, uh, becoming a professor in the Backyard University, which is Youngstown State. And I was there for four years. Um, Youngstown is really a casting and forging city. It's really a metals town. So I continued to do electronics, but looked at ceramics and metals and other material systems. And uh, about a year ago, I decided to come back to UTEP. Uh, it's on the border of Mexico. The weather here is pretty spectacular. And the food is, is uh, well, let's just say the Mexican food in Ohio is not necessarily the greatest. And uh, I've gained weight since I've been back. Uh, <laughs> unfortunate, <laughs> but you know, and um, yeah, so I'm back here now. Of course, there's a pandemic. I'm in my house. I don't even have an office at the university yet, uh, but doing some really interesting stuff. And I'll talk about it all, I guess. I, I don't want to spill the beans early. Yeah, I spill the show, but do you feel like that people are being in the additive manufacturing bubble? Do you feel like when you talk to people who are not necessarily in this field, that they are getting a better understanding of what additive manufacturing is, or when you explain it to them, that um, they are well aware of what's happening? I don't know about well aware, but I, th I think a lot of people, you know, gosh, my brother-in-law just sat, you know, was telling me, wow, you know, this 3D printing thing is pretty important. You know, I'm like, you know, come on, 
Yeah, I was almost insulted by it. He has no idea. His, he's in construction. Uh, but of course, now they're doing concrete and he heard about that and was, yeah. So I think it's it, since about 2012, 2013, at least at some level, you know, you see you see this in pop culture. I was just watching a show called Made in Space where they printed something, uh, you know, while they're in a spaceship. So I think, yeah, pop, popular culture is aware of it. I don't think they understand the details. And then if you look at something more niche like 3D printed electronics, yeah, I think it's um, it's less understood for sure. But and I- then, Do you think you know, at your university, for example, students, are students becoming more, more, more aware of it? So I noticed, so Oliver mentioned in his presentation that it's, it takes education or people to learn about it um, to invest in it and then also to bring it back to the industries or to bring it back to the um, actual, well, actual I'll tell producers. You, yeah. The two universities that I've been at, Youngstown State and UTEP, they have really strong additive manufacturing programs. So for not necessarily for electronics, but in general, I think that, yeah, these students are steeped in, you know, solid modeling and understanding that it's not going to be injection molding, but it, it'll be a different process that could be layer by layer if, if that process provides a benefit. So I do think at least the students around me are all hyper aware of additive in general and how it can benefit, you know, mass customization, the digital paradigm of manufacturing, um, complex geometries. Yeah, we have the software in topology that uh, it's a New York City company that's doing these spatially varying lattices and, and really cool stuff. I got a lot to show there too. And these students can think about it. And I just absolutely struggle uh, with salt modeling in general. I'm actually in the nineties, I was an electrical engineer. I'm, I am an electrical engineer, which is sort of an odd uh, discipline in additive. I obviously for 3D printed electronics, it's not so odd, but um, so I was a chip designer. I worked on the Sony PlayStation 4, the microprocessor and came here and I couldn't get funding because that was too industrial. Um, the National Science Foundation in the United States isn't really interested in what Intel is doing, for instance. And that's why I, with the Keck Center, which is a, a famous additive manufacturing center here at UTEP, we started exploring electronics. So yeah, I think students, I think, yeah, you know, their brains haven't completely wired. And so they, yeah, just like learning languages or learning new CAD approaches, they seem to pick this up much more quickly. And all the stuff you see in front of you right now was done by students, of course. Oh, wow, really? Oh, that's I, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my, yeah, I don't think I could have done any of those. Okay, well, I but guess, you, huh? You want me to get kicked off? Yeah, let's go, let's start. Um, okay. I will give you the space and thank you so much for joining everyone, Dr. Eric McDonald. Hey, well, I'm really excited to be here and of course, um, a big community uh, of people, I think, is beginning to, to form in this area. And I've been in it for 20 years. I guess I'm now officially an old man. Uh, but I'll probably start by giving some historical perspective. And of course, being an old man, history, it, yeah, it's kind of a yeah, double-edged word. But um, just to give a, an idea of how this has evolved at UTEP anyway. And then as I've moved out and collaborated with universities around the world and national institutes, uh, you know, just looking at the different applications that can benefit and how we pursued those uh, with different technologies. And um, yeah, let me just begin. So anyway, these are just photogenic uh, pictures that I like to show. Um, magnetometers, something for NASA, a button. Let me continue. So let me tell you where I'm at. I'll make this quick. I'm at, at UTEP, which is in the, the middle of the Mexican-American order and UTEP is a, a, pri a primarily a Hispanic serving institution with a large population of, of students with uh, either from Mexico or have Mexican heritage. And I went to Youngstown, which is completely different. They have a lot of trees there, as you can see in the picture. Uh, but what's interesting, I'll show this at the end, uh, it, at UTEP, we have Bhutanese architecture. So it's Himalayan Buddhist architecture. And it's just something I've always loved. And it it oddly uh, is well suited for the, the Southwest landscape, which is very arid. But just to give you a sense of where I'm at, and I, I should tell you also that America Makes, which I just mentioned, is uh, the first of a series of, of a network of manufacturing institutes that was started almost 10 years ago in the United States. 
it's just clearly Fraunhofer inspired its public private partnership model and very industrial and implied. And at UTEP, I'd been, we had been receiving funding uh, from this institute. And so I ended up going, going to the mothership more or less and working at Youngstown State, which is about maybe three blocks away from the institute. And I've just returned to El Paso. So there's, I'll try to, with logos at the bottom, I tried to tell the story of where things were done, but let's continue. And I can tell you that we, you know, additive has seven different processes, categories of taxonomy that can be separated pretty well. There's a couple of cases like cold spray that may be difficult to, to, to place. But in any case, I have done research in all of these seven, not necessarily electronics in all seven, but I've published papers in all of them. And um, that gives me sort of a broad, a good broad view of the landscape of what's possible or what's available for building ceramics, metals, plastics, elastomers. And, um, and so I've just been trying to find the applications that might benefit and the processes that are well suited for these applications and trying to combine them. Whereas a lot of what was discussed previously was very much more industrial or on the cusp or, or actually commercialized uh, what I'm doing is more of the laboratory blue sky research, looking out 10, 15 years and just thinking about what's possible to, to capture people's imaginations first, but, you know, to, to be thought provoking and, and hopefully help jar these technologies into applications that, that can help, you know, industry. Quick shameless plug. Uh, I'm a co-founding editor of Additive Manufacturing published by Elsevier. And um, this journal has been around since 2014 and is currently the highest impact factor journal for all of manufacturing. And so it's been a huge success. It's kind of just dumb luck. We started this right as popular culture, um, you know, really started to focus on additive and uh, it's been real exciting. We get to see the latest and greatest research. And of course, if any graduate students or professors are on the line, uh, if you're interested in publishing, you know, certainly contact me and I can, you know, help facilitate the submissions. And really last week we started a second journal. It's partnered with the first, it's also Elsevier, and it's for shorter format papers that are sort of more groundbreaking early research. Uh, and I'm the editor in chief of that. And so I'm definitely promoting that one because uh, it just started and we're interested in getting really good research and electronics would certainly fall within scope if it's used in the context of additive manufacturing. Oh, I just went backwards. Okay, so here's just an overview of what I've been trying to do. Um, you know, take 3D printing on the upper left, uh, a suite of complementary processes, either separate or integrated, generally separated because I'm doing it for the first time, and then doing this sort of montage of different things that you see. And I said multifunctionality. If you look at the Oak Ridge piece, which is just that was done a long time ago by Lonnie Love, and it's just fascinating. It's got pneumatic control. There's no electronics in that. It was electron beam melting, uh, powder bed fusion process. But to me, it's an idea of, of making the additive do to create, fabricate structures that are not just load bearing structures, but actually have other functionalities. And I'll talk about a lot of these as I go. So I'm not going to waste much time here. Okay, so historically what we did at UTEP is we used stereolithography, uh, VAT photopolymerization, um, and basically interrupted the process. We actually even had at one point an arm that came in and put in conductive inks, uh, put in components, and then continued. And this uh, process gives you really good like resolution, but also gives you good surface finish, uh, but it is relegated to photochemistry. So, in El Paso, a lot of our parts, if you left them on a window, the sun here is so intense that they continue to cure. And because of that, you know, they can become more brittle or discolor. And, and so there's some problems with this approach and also conductive inks, of course, uh, because they're restricted to a temperature, say under 150 C because of the polymer substrate, uh, they don't necessarily, they certainly don't get to the, the conductivity of bulk metal. And so that's something we've been trying to address. And I've got some interesting things to show uh, throughout this presentation on that, I believe. Uh, but this, oh, this was the dice. So this is actually the dumbest thing I think we've ever done because it's probably, it should be done with conventional approaches. But the, the point was, is that when you roll the dice and, and the accelerometer tells you which way gravity is going and it lights the, the LEDs on the top, 
everybody understands it, you know, a kindergartner or a senator that I'm trying to shake money out of. And so from that standpoint, um, it's been a good showpiece. Uh, we even tried to commercialize this going to casinos and they're like, wait, you know, with 3D printing, you could spatially vary the density and make this a cheat dice. And we're like, of course, no problem. And of course that killed the deal. They wanted nothing to do with it. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of other applications that are just much more appropriate, like, a, you know, conformal to human anatomy, like a helmet insert with an accelerometer, but people just didn't understand it. It wasn't immediately obvious. So this, this uh, piece was done in 2009 in a conference in, in Vegas, which inspired the idea and um, yeah, we're trying to redo this now. It's been dead for 10 years. The batteries are all gone. All the different dice that we made are not working. We're trying to do it in ceramics and I'll show a little bit about that in a moment. And another, just looking back historically, this was also 2008, 2009. The interesting thing here is, you know, you're talking about a pill with a, a microcontroller in it. That little on the bottom left, you see the little square. That's that's like 50 million transistors. It's a completely self-contained programmable computer. All you need to do is give it a sensor and a battery and, and it can compute, it can read the sensor, it can blink a light, it could send a message. And uh, this was just interesting because we this the idea was initially we were trying to compete with standard electronics and we really wanted to get rid of the package and try and miniaturize things. Uh, but the conductivity of these inks, again, was a bit of a struggle. This is a low power application, so it didn't matter so much here. But we started to look at other applications that had high power, and that's where we started to explore other technologies. And so this was complete. This is a time lapse of building a motor. And so that's a bearing. And um, this was 2009 as well. And the idea here is this is a high power, uh, you know, application. So we needed conductivity. And so what we're going to do is do a lot of manual intervention here, but this led, this video led to a lot of funding from America Makes to automate these systems. So here we're putting magnets in manually into uh, the rotor. So this is two structures, one inside of the other, and they're independent. There's no support material used. All things were done with overhangs that had gentle uh, angles. Uh, and this is the Keck Center from a long time ago. These are electromagnets. And you're going to notice that this student, one of my best students ever, Ephraim, uh, he's manually inserting wires into channels. And so these are the things that we ended up getting patents on to automate. And, and this isn't a, a solution that would replace inks. I think putting wires into 3D printing is got its applications for sure, high power applications, but it's more difficult to get the high routing densities that you would need, uh, you know, because um, obviously, well, not obviously, we got we got pretty high routing densities, but here you see that he is, He's plugging this in and we don't have a battery. I'll talk about that in a moment, but with the you know pulse of modulation, he can get 8,000 RPM right out of the printer. And my dream was always to have a, a robot or a UAV just come out of the printer. And one of the problems was at least in those days, thermal plastic extrusion, which is what we're now using, a second process, uh, is in a heated build envelope to help with residual stresses and so forth. And so batteries are just, well, it was a dangerous thing to insert into those basically ovens. Uh, but I'll tell you in a moment that I've got a cool project with 3D printed batteries that I'm working on currently with a French Fulbrighter. Okay. So embedding wires, we started to automate that. We've looked at several different things, thermal embedding and also ultrasonic embedding. And sort of the big advantage here is that you're not heating up the whole plastic, it's selectively heating it or inserting energy. This is ultrasonic. There's no heat, it's vibrating. And so that allows us to, to embed these, you know, bulk conductivity um, wires into uh, the structures. This is actually a BAM. So this is a very large, the black material is a very large 3D printed uh, structure. And Lockheed Martin borrowed the technology uh, in a conference to, to demonstrate that they could put wires into the, the structure. And they did it for electrical reasons. Uh, they had a circuit at the top. But what's interesting is you see the layering of that black material. And of course, the anisotropy of additive manufacturing is a big concern where, you know, your weakness is in this, the build direction in many cases. And these wires actually acted as reinforcement agents. Uh, that sphere that you see is a different additive manufacturing structure. That's a propulsion tank, and it was done with directed energy deposition by Lockheed. It's just a fascinating project. Slade Gardner is a hero of mine. 
Um, and then here you can see we can get pretty good routing density. So what you see is a cross section of basically a thermoplastic 3D printed structure and we've embedded wires. And you can see that we have a planar surface after we have embedded it, the wires so that we can continue upon which we can continue to print um, and you get bulk conductivity. Where inks have a big advantage over uh, these wires is trying to connect to the chips. We looked at laser microwelding for uh, a couple of years and you can see that was a successful picture there of welding the wires, but that we tended to damage the parts. So, because there would be an uh, introduction of too much heat. So, I, you know, there's lots of different ways to approach this. Each one has advantages and disadvantages. Here we get conductivity and improve the structure, but that final uh, section where you need to actually connect to the components is a challenge for this technology. And really what funded us a lot was space, aerospace uh, companies, NASA. And we really were looking at trying to make CubeSat small satellite components where we could, you know, you, uh, really leverage the spatial uh, efficiency of additive. Uh, and this is a CubeSat. We actually threw a, flew a CubeSat, a part of one in space. We're about to do another one, hopefully next year. Uh, but the idea then is these are space, aerospace qualifiable materials like Altem, Peak, Peck, very, very good thermoplastics. And you embed wires. So you basically, you know, many people say that that additive manufacturing or 3D printing gives you complexity for free. You can argue that's true or not. But what we were trying to argue is that this technology, this enhanced technology, could give you electronics for free because they get sucked into the structure and uh, you know save space and, and potentially even improve the mechanical performance. And so all of that led to this first America Makes project. There's been more since then that have been integrated, but here you have two Stratus systems. They were a partner in this project and they gave us proprietary access to the software so we could start in one machine, go to another with a different material, um, which is interesting, but really where you're, what you're about to see now is I think the magic of this. And it's another gantry to this in between them right there that provides all these other manufacturing uh, processes. So here we're doing machining. So one of the problems with thermoplastic extrusion is the resolution and surface finish. Well, now we can go in and we can planarize it and make it smoother and we can add fine features. So whereas stereolithography, that photopolymerization gives us really good resolution, but maybe the materials weren't functional, at least at that point, we could leverage thermoplastics, put in copper tapes, foils, wires, inks, and even just put boards in directly. So this is a board I had designed and it got placed into a cavity and then you could continue to print on top of that. And I've already shown this, but this is a, the wiring, which would allow you to, to get the good conductivity. That system could use inks too though. And, uh, and it did. There you see some extrusion right there of, of uh, fluids. Let me go to the next slide. So that's what I did at UTEP originally. And I left in 2016, I went to Youngstown Metals, ceramics, and elastomers became my focus. Um, and ironically, I went back to stereolithography, but a new version of it. So Carbon is a company in San Jose, and they have this very interesting approach. Um, but what's really interesting, because it's, it's simply stereolithography, uh, more or less. But what I really am impressed with this company is that they have made strides in the materials. And they're actually in production currently for years now, doing the Adidas Future Tech Shoe. And so immediately I think about that. It's like, I'm going to have two shoes that match my feet perfectly. How cool. And, you know, that's the big advantage of 3D printing, but that's not what they're doing. They're still doing standard sizes because of the rest of the shoe, but it's the complexity of the geometries that they can exploit to really tailor the mechanical performance of the shoe. And the fact that you can walk on these 3D printed structures is a testament to the durability of the materials. And so one of the concepts, and you're going to see this a lot moving forward is, this is a difficult process to integrate electronics into, right? It's building from the bottom up. But the idea then is you could build these parts. You really are building green parts that need further UV curing. And if you built a, you know, a collection of parts that all mated together with complex surfaces that you know, had mortise and tenon type features, then you could cure those. You imbue the mechanical performance into each substructure, but you consolidate them into one structure. And so I've been sort of exploring that concept that there would be a post-assembly step after doing 3D printing 
And that would allow you to introduce electronics into the superficial surfaces before you assemble the parts. And so they could be embedded in the end, uh, but, but with much more freedom in terms of the, the orientation of the components, for instance. Well, I think I've got a, so you can see the sphere is sort of conceptual, four pieces that come together and you have components in, on all the different superficial surfaces before assembly. And then the superficial surfaces after assembly would generally not have electronics, but they could, they would be unprotected, however. And here's just an example of putting wires between two elastomer pieces, and then we consolidated them uh, with the UV cure. And so th there's pros and cons to this approach. The assembly is one of the things that 3D printing gets rid of, and it's now required again. But you know, I'm always just trying to push the edge of what, what's possible. And uh, here's an example. This is kind of interesting. This is not Adidas. This is New Balance shoe, and it's Form Labs. Uh, which is very similar to carbon, but it's a stereolithography system. And again, this is a commercially available shoe. I sent Form Labs this design and they built it for me in the rebound material, which is not commercially available. And I put a capacitive sensor into it. Uh, it turns out Youngstown hosted an NFL event. If you know about the American football, uh, the National Football League uh, is playing football currently with 3D printed helmets from carbon. Uh, and the idea here was I wanted to measure impact. And there, I should tell you, if you see green text throughout my presentation, that's typically, well, that is a, a, a publication. And almost all of my publications, I try to make open access. So for instance, this is uh, this video and, and the text associated with it are available on IEEE. And uh, okay, so I talked about batteries and how that would be really interesting uh, to have a UAV or a robot walk out of a printer. And I've recently, I'm hosting a, a Fulbright. That's sort of like a, the American Road Scholar, uh, where you invite uh, scholars and students from around the world to the United States. And he is a, a famous uh, French researcher in uh, battery, uh, 3D printing batteries using thermoplastic extrusion. We're now working with Sandia and NASA and looking at VAT photopolymerization and sort of mixing in the electroactive particles into the VAT photopolymerization resin and trying to make complex multi-material structures that would be shape conformable, but also provide potentially higher power performance. And so this is really exciting. He's just arrived a couple of months ago. His wife is with him and she is also a, a, a PhD from France uh, with background in batteries, having worked at Renault. And so we're really excited about, about this project. And this is propulsion. I wanted to kind of point out that it's not all electronics. This is a, basically a coaxial piece with tef Teflon in between two copper pieces. And if you put about 5,000 volts, it will ablate in a vacuum. You're looking at a bar gel, a bell jar, excuse me, and it's in a vacuum. And, and you see wires going into that structure, and it's giving thousands of volts. And this is something that you couldn't do with inks, for instance. But it's limited in terms of of maybe the resolution of the or the routing density. Okay. Okay, so then I something I think is really exciting is just in general ceramics, there's been a lot of strides in making these and making them with very complex geometries. And, and even in technical ceramics, it can go to very high temperatures. They're wear resistant. There's a lot of interesting applications for this. And of course, Electronics hasn't really been explored, but this is something that I'm probably focused on the most. Uh, we have a lot of different ways of 3D printing ceramics. I think all seven processes have been used, um, but generally speaking, they make green parts, and then you have to put them through a sintering cycle that can take 60 hours at, at you know, over 1,000 degrees C. So it, it's not where you're going to put electronics in at the green part state and then cure the, the ceramics. But this idea that inks cannot normally get to the high enough temperatures when they're being cured because of the polymer substrate, that problem is eliminated with ceramics. And also you can do lattices and you can do very complex structures. And so um, these tend to be electromagnetically, they have a high dielectric strength. They have potentially a, a high permittivity, which can be useful in some cases, and they have low loss. And so I'm really excited about ceramics. And one, a really interesting thing is that's Kate Rubens. She just returned to earth from the International Space Station about a month ago. But while she was there, she had commissioned a VAT photopolymerization system specifically for ceramics. 
And the idea is you've got this liquid polymer and it's got ceramic particles and on earth they tend to settle or float. And uh, in microgravity, of course, they, they stay in suspension. So we think we can get you know, microstructure that would not be possible on earth. And so we're looking at the battery project in ceramics uh, with Youngstown State and UTEP collaborating on that. We haven't gotten this funded yet, but we've been working closely with the company and we have several different opportunities that we think will will allow us to print in space uh, this year. And uh, this is real brief, just this isn't any of my work. This is just standard traditional low temperature co-fired ceramics where they take green state tape of, of ceramic alumina and they punch them to put holes and patterns and they stack them and they screen print in silver paste and then they fire them under pressure. And then you get these very high performance two and a half D structures for electronics. So uh, Pedro Cortez and I at Youngstown State have been thinking about how can we bring additive manufacturing to this and make it truly 3D, like make a sphere or something similar that would have electronics in it. You know, there's microfluidics that's shown here that's already being done, but you could do microfluidics with graceful bends and in, in internal fluidic channels. And whereas here it's more two and a half D, so it's more of a 90 degree angle. So we think there's huge opportunities here and we've been exploring this for the last 12 months. And again, this idea of overmolding, these are kind of bad examples. These are very early ones, uh, but the idea you could take these green ceramic parts, assemble them together, fire them for 60 hours at 1450C and they come out as a single consolidated structure. And so you wouldn't do that with a microprocessor in there. I mean, I think at 400 degrees, you'd lose your you know, your interconnect in the semiconductor devices, but, um, but we're looking at some interesting concepts here. And one of which would be to put high temperature metal inks. So where everybody's looking to get the, the metals to be low temperature because you're restricted by the polymer substrate, here we're worried about, you know, copper might start to boil at 1450. So we need tungsten, nickel, uh, and a variety of other uh, inks. And we've actually done thermal couples with two different inks. Um, we're working with a, another company, not uh, Optimec, but uh, IDS, which is a, a co-founder of Optimec and, and looking at using aerosol jetting. On the bottom left, you see a spiral sinusoidal disc with a, well, a spiral antenna that was done in, in silver ink using Optimec system. And so there, there's just some really interesting applications. It turns out that, that piece on the left bottom was Material Jetting, uh, an Israeli company, XJet. Um, Youngstown Business Incubator was the first uh, installation of their, their system in the United States. And so I was really excited about it. It does zirconia. Zirconia has a very high permittivity, which for digital electronics is a bad thing, but maybe for an antenna, it affects the speed of light and, and the, it, it could be used for a lot of electromagnetics applications, which I'll show in a second. And again, we got a paper back in 2019 on that. And we've got two that are about to get published right now that are looking at lattices specifically. Uh, and here's a great example of the, the XJet. I mean, the intricate detail is amazing. There's some support material that we failed to remove, you may see, but um, that's a uniform lattice. It's a one millimeter uh, unit cell, which is cool, very small. And it's zirconia, so it has a high permittivity. And so the idea is with a, a spatially varying lattice, which I'll show right now. Actually, I've got a couple of examples you can actually change the density of this, the effective density of this uh, throughout. And if, this, if the lattice you know, cells are 10 times lower than a frequency of interest electromagnetically, they're sort of electromagnetically transparent, it's probably not the word, irrelevant maybe. And so you can make the electromagnetic sort of you know, sense that your permittivity is changing from one side to the other. And of course the speed of light is directly related to the permittivity. And uh, something that's really kind of inspired me from a long time ago is the University of Arizona, Hao Sin, did a Lundberg lens in polymer. And so it's a lattice that is densest in the center and is radially, spherically uh, less dense. And that allows you to make a lens where you can take parallel electromagnetic lines and then focus them on the other side. So this idea of filters, lenses, I, I just think is really interesting and specifically in the case of, of ceramics. And there are the two papers you see. Uh, one was submitted, one just got accepted today, the mechanical properties paper, which is I think pretty interesting. So a lot of exciting stuff. 
And then going to metals, uh, maybe two or three years ago, we I had this idea with a graduate student, Kerry Johnson at Youngstown State. It's like, hey, why don't we do a survey? Try to build some pathologically difficult structure that was ha has some electromagnetic relevance, a dipole uh, fractal antenna in this case, and just see which systems could build this metal structure. And so here's sort of a table. Um, the one on the left is an EOS uh, powder bed fusion. Uh, the one in the middle is sort of funny. It was binder jetted and the company built it for us, shipped it to me in this box and the FedEx person put it in front of my garage and my 16 year old daughter at the time ran over it and it did break and it deformed a little bit, but this is a testament to the strength of some of these materials. <clears throat> and then we worked with NASA Glenn to evaluate the ones that we could get built. We did plastic parts and we plated them. Uh, we were really wanting to do desktop metal and mark forged, which are material extrusion processes that have much wider range of materials like copper. And uh, we never got them to, to build one for us, but at some point I, I hope to try to reproduce that. And that's in the, there's a paper on this, I think, that's pretty interesting. And the idea here is that you could, you could quickly simulate in electromagnetic software a wide range of geometries, and then you could quickly print them and have a freestanding, you know, strong structure. Uh, so I think the field of electromagnetics really stands to benefit from additive more, you know, in addition to electronics, I think antennas, filters, lenses is just a very exciting area. And then we tried to do that again. We did a different fractal. And this one's cool because it was done in powder bed fusion. The one on the upper left is aluminum, uh, a 3D printed alloy of aluminum version of it. But there's a piece inside of another piece, a pyramid in a pyramid, sort of a ship in the bottle approach. And we actually have to use uh, dielectric standoffs in four points to hold it in place. Um, and this antenna, is it, it works really well and it's it's just an interesting example of the way we have to rethink how we design things, particularly like uh, antennas. And the one on the bottom right is from the company Trump in Germany, and they have a green laser system, which now is enabling copper. And so copper uh, obviously has better conductivity. Um, it, it, yeah, so we're about to publish a paper on this as well. Um, and I think that's just fascinating. So the materials choices, the processes, there's just so much available now and then many different applications we haven't thought of that could leverage these the combination of processes and materials and then i got a couple slides i'd just like to show this mainly for entertainment value but this is binder jetting of sand and the idea here is you make a mold that's sacrificial but can have very complex geometries like the lattice on the right that you see uh, and here's just an example at youngstown state they have a foundry they you know the, they take the 3d printed sand stack it up and then they pour metal into it and again, why am I showing this? We were talking about 3D printed electronics. Well, um, the University of Bremen actually put in, in the Fraunhofer there have used casting with uh, electronics embedded into the casting to have an embedded sensor inside of a structure. But here you see they're breaking the sand off and we have you know, some sort of T-pipe or something. And, uh, but of course, I like to put a lot of electronics into stuff. So I'll, I've been looking at a variety of Bluetooth IoT uh, approaches. You can see there's a lot of publications here. And you can actually 3D print the sand in such a way that it has a cavity to put the sensors in. And then you could cap that off to protect it from the molten metal that will eventually be right next to it. And that picture on the upper left is actually uh, a core. So it's an internal cavity for the metal casting. And it's suspended from a ceiling of a larger mold. And the idea is it would just sort of be hanging down and then the, it would, the cavity that it was in would fill with molten metal. And for about two minutes, we're collecting data that nobody's ever collected deep inside of a very complex sand mold. So it's really revolution, revolutionizing um, this industry, I think. It's a 3,000 year old industry. And now we're, we're getting cell phone technology into that. And then I've got one kind of cool video. This is magnesium, which is very dangerous. And I didn't know that. I'm an electrical engineer if I didn't say that before. But you see my phone on the top of the, the screen, it's actually reading the sensor deep inside of this, this 3D printed sand. So the outside's a cube, that's not very interesting geometrically, but the inside of this is extremely elaborate and a, a casting that's um, for an aerospace company. And here you're seeing that I'm collecting data from deep inside of that motion, uh, magnetic field, pressure, temperature, humidity. And we published papers on all the different you know concepts that, you know, 
information that would have utility for the casting industry. So a lot of cool stuff going there. And then I'll end with one more uh, project. And this was with the University of Bremen. Um, and we have, we have at Youngstown State directed to energy deposition. So this shoots a metal powder coaxially with a, a laser and basically creates metal structures. A uh, lot of interesting aspects to this technology for me. Um, I think generally these make bigger metal structures, a wide range of materials. They can even use wire, which is a lot cheaper than powder. Um, but the idea is that you could interrupt these processes and inter introduce electronics, or at least in this case, passive sensors. Uh, and at Bremen, they screen printed on to an insert that we built, the gray piece, a, a strain gauge. They shipped it back to us, and then we built tensile bars, put this piece in, and then we laser clad over it. Uh, about 20% survived, uh, but the, the printed sensor in this case was ceramic space, so it could handle the high temperatures. And I, got, I think I got a cool video for this. Well, this is the sensor that the University of Bremen did. Very first case, we have a much more sophisticated version that we're working on now, uh, but this video sort of shows it. And I think this is, this is interesting. You know, tensile bars are not interesting to me. Those are really boring, uh, but you see the inserts, it's been machined. And then this is the insert going into the cavity. I'm sorry, I meant to say cavity. You see two wires coming out of it. So we're gonna go in and with the laser, we're gonna stitch weld it. We're gonna put them together, but watch the multimeter on the left. You see that it immediately reads uh, the sensor. And then, uh, so that's stitch weld. So it's one piece, but we're now gonna put a layer of metal over it. You can see the spatter shooting off. And um, in this case, we put one layer and it's laser clad. So it's a rough surface. You see it here, it's kind of uh, bumpy, but we can machine that. This is actually a directed energy deposition system in a CNC system. So you can machine it away, get good surface finish. Uh, and again, a tensile bar is boring, but you could imagine a lattice where at one layer, you know, the struts have strain gauges and that lattice might be used for light weighting a landing gear strut or something along those lines. And then these sensors could tell you, you know, warn you about an imminent failure potentially. I mean, just this is sort of the blue sky research more maybe, but uh, and there's a lot of difficulties here. And even just inserting the sensor into the structure, it's it it's in a location that you normally wouldn't have access to, but it would also degrade the mechanical performance. You'd have to compensate for that. Uh, but I think that's really interesting. And I'm I'm working uh, with the Fraunhofer and Bre Bremen right now. We're writing a proposal on on casting and, and sensors in general in metal objects. And here you can see there's two really points of data. One was in situ. You actually can see this thing being built. This is where the laser is going over the metal structure. But then after the fact, we had an end use application. So that was stainless steel. It, you know, it's a functional material. It's as good as cast. Uh, so this is a case where additive can be used to be put into a plane. And then we can read data from within that functional structure. Uh, so additive is definitely maturing and becoming, you know, industrially relevant. And, you know, I don't think it's going to replace traditional manufacturing completely, but it's going to, it's going to open up applications that we're not even thinking of yet. And so I'm really excited to be a part of this. And um, I think, yeah, my last slide just shows my university. So the bottom left is actually Bhutan in the Himalayas, and you can see the Buddhist temples. And then you, the other three are, are my university. And the two on the right, what you see in the background is actually Mexico, our sister city of Ciudad Juarez, um, where the food is even better than in El Paso, by the way. Um, but in any case, and then on the upper left, you can see the Franklin Mountains, which is the end of the Rockies. Uh, and that's, that's a mountain that splits our city in half. And I like to show these just as a segue to say that if anybody's in, I, I wouldn't say Texas, because we're like a thousand kilometers from most of the population of Texas. But if you're in the Southwest, uh, you, you know, I'd like to extend an open invitation to anybody that wants to talk about research or come in and see the laboratories and so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely a, a believer in collaboration. And with that, uh, Natalie, I, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Let's try and take over first. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, it's okay, Eric. Thank you for this uh, enlightening presentation. Give us a different perspective. Tell us also what we can see in the aerospace industry, in the avionics with the integration of sensors that will probably improve the maintenance schedule for the airplanes and so on. 
and improve the safety of the aviation industry and also in the car industry probably as well as many others. So this is great. Uh, really thank you for your presentation. Uh, there are several questions that I would like to, to bring the, that we have received through the presentation. So they are from different subjects all around. Okay. Since you cover such a broad spectrum of things, which is great to see. And um, hopefully in one of these days I'll stop by there and uh, Definitely. across the border and taste the food between both okay. sides of the border. Of course. So, so uh, first question is, uh, at the beginning you show a module uh, that is at the at the low orbit, is it exposed to the uh, space environment? What kind of module it is? And uh, what is the experience of the uh, space environment in that module? Well, okay, yeah. so it oh. turns out, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so it turns out that was a small part of a one U cube set done with the University of New Mexico. And uh, it was basically just some simple electronics. You can see in the back, so you can see through it, it was stereolithography, but you see there's a serpentine structure you know, we were curious about the outgassing of the conductive inks and so forth. Uh, but unfortunately, in this example, um, 35 CubeSats went up in 2013. And uh, so I guess I'm being a little disingenuous saying it. it is in low Earth orbit, but that a power supply company that for CubeSats gave, uh, provided seven power supplies to seven of the 35. We had that power supply and it was not operational. So we did not actually get to test this out. We're doing another launch. We're hoping um, even, maybe even this year or next, we're gonna try and do similar experiments. Uh, but I can tell you the VAT photopolymerization, NASA has a database about outgassing. And so um, this material doesn't outgas, which I think is a problem for plastic where you might you know, put a coat over a camera lens or something if your materials start to outgas in a vacuum. There's atomic oxygen, which is very corrosive. Um, so there's a lot of things that are trying to destroy your electronics in space. Um, but I know that there's three space qualified thermoplastics, pink, Altem, and Peck, which are theoretically usable in, uh, probably are usable, used in satellites today. Uh, but then, yeah, the conductive inks might be an issue, outgassing, uh, incredible temperature swings from highs to lows, just based on if you're facing the sun or not. But, uh, you know, in that example, additive can really potentially bring a solution in that thermal management. If electromagnetics is a really interesting application space for 3D printing, I think thermal management is as well, because you can put microfluidics through this and pull the heat away or add heat when necessary. Um, so uh, I guess I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, it is in low Earth orbit, but it's a part of the, the growing problem of space debris, unfortunately. So. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it's a question of somebody else in the, in the audience. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just reading from the questions here. Okay. And we're producing them. Sometimes the questions come multiple times and I just consolidate them to. Of course. Okay. Um, Somebody wants to know what is the internet platform uh, uh, with public access that uh, people can see your work? Oh, um, well, if you go to Google Scholar, um, you can look me up. I have an account and basically all articles are listed there with the link. I would say 50% are open access. The later ones are definitely open access. I, I tend to, to either pay an extra fee or some other mechanism so that it's completely open. You can just download the PDF directly. And another thing is you'll notice I had a lot of these 10 second videos throughout the presentation. I try to also include something that's a little more informative in terms of a quick video to show things being uh, done. So if you do get a paper, make sure you look at more than the PDF. If there is a, well, when I punched that uh, NFL last summer, that, that video is a part of the paper, for instance. And so you can actually see it. But Google okay. Scholar, I think, probably captures everything very well. Okay, thank you. I hope, hopefully, that answers for the, the person that asked this question. Um, you mentioned about low temperature coal fire ceramics. How mm. low is that temperature, and will that be compatible with a, with a silver or copper? Right. So it's actually used with silver currently, and it's typically like a thick paste that's screen printed on. Now, this isn't what we're doing. This is what's already being done, and it's 850, I believe. is. So when they say low temperature, they're, they're talking about 850 degrees. 
uh, which I guess is a low temperature for a ceramic. Uh, but so then what we're looking at, and this is Pedro Cortez, who's a real, really a ceramics expert at Youngstown State, a fascinating researcher, very productive, prolific writer. Um, and so everything that you see here is a collaboration between us. But the idea is that that zirconia requires 1450. So that is not compatible with copper, but it could be compatible with nickel, tungsten, molybdenum, a lot of different metals that are available in ink form, in an ink format. Um, and in that way, really, you'd like to green part print the ceramics, ink them, assemble them, and then fire them would be the sort of the holy grail here. And then we could do very complex structures. You know, you see the pyramid there, it's a kind of a bad piece, but it just sort of gives you an idea of the, the geometries we're looking at. And you could have inks running through them through all the superficial surfaces. And generally speaking, uh, we find the compatibility between the metal inks and the, the ceramics is pretty good. Like we do tape tests and they're, they're very strong. Um, Adhesion is very strong, but putting a, a channel that might be triangular with an opening on the top so that you can put ink into the triangle, the triangular channel, and then fire that. And then the inks and the ceramics shrink during the firing, which is another big challenge we have to deal with, we're working on. But the idea would be then you capture the, the structure. And then if you embed that, um, you know, and you essentially interpose the inks between two ceramic pieces, then, it, you know, adhere, adhesion is not as important of a, a, a structure or uh, characteristic. But this is what we're saying could compete with LTCC. And the idea then is just, we bring to bear uh, the complex geometries like lattices and, and you know, shape specific structures. Um, and also the newly available materials, which are just amazing. I mean, the XJet system really is amazing in my opinion. And uh, of course that's material jetting. So. I don't know, I didn't count the processes that I talked about, but that ink jets down a material, support in, in, a, in a solution with nanoparticles of ceramic, you have to remove the support with water soluble process. That's how I got that lattice. And then you have to fire this for like as long as 60 hours at very high temperatures to get the final product. Uh, but, but it's a real exciting technology. And also bat photopolymerization like in the International Space Station, uh, there's many companies now, Boston Microfabrication, Tethon, uh, Lithos in Austria, they're doing uh, stereolithography type ceramics. So there's just a lot of cool stuff going on in the ceramics world. And there's definitely an application into electronics. And the idea that these metal inks then, like that silver ink, we could fire the ceramic, print on it on the final piece, and then we can fire that metal to 850 degrees, no problem, and get bulk silver conductivity. So it's just a real exciting thing. Uh, you know, I don't know if Nano Dimensions works with XJet, but it seems like that might be a natural partnership that I don't think XJet's looking at electronics and, and I don't know if Nano Dimensions is looking at ceramics, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that would be an interesting uh, subject since the two companies, R&D, are just across the street from each other, right? Oh, really? That's interesting. Well, I went, I visited them two, three years ago. I went to, I went to Tel Aviv and... It's just a fascinating company. I didn't know I was right next door to you guys, huh? Yeah, yeah. I should have visited. But what's your opinion on, uh, they are a family of ceramics that their sintering temperature is below 400 degrees. What's your opinion on that? Gosh, uh, you know, I'm only looking at the ones that are at 2000 because that's what's of real interest, I think. What are those ceramics? Uh, I don't even know what, what uh, there's a ceramic that it's would- basically dopants, uh, some, uh, zirconia or some other dopants that are added to the traditional uh, aluminum oxide that lowers the sintering temperature. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I think, let me think, well, if that allows you to make electronics where you can cure the, the metal, you know, sufficiently at 400 C, uh, that's interesting. I, I'm going to investigate that. If you've got any uh, leads on where I could get those materials, Pedro Cortez and I will go bananas. But, but I'll tell you, the, the real interesting aspect of ceramics, generally speaking, besides the electromagnetic properties is the high temperature. So we're trying to go to really high temperatures so we can put something into a gas turbine, you know, that's creating electricity and, and add a sensor or something along those lines. Um, but there may be these mid-level applications where these low temperature ceramics that you're talking about could be useful. Because clearly polymers aren't gonna go to 400 C. 
Okay. Uh, another question, the last two questions I have here. Um, have you looked at the relatively new desktop metals, metal powder binder jetting? Okay, so the they've got a binder jetting system and I have not looked at that. Uh, I, I did show that NASA fractal antenna, which was inspired by desktop metal and Mark Forged, uh, but it was the material extrusion process that I was interested in and I wasn't given access to it. Um, I think we're currently trying to do a, a copper antenna similar to that pyramid that I showed you using desktop metals material extrusion system, but I'm not familiar with uh, their binder. I haven't used it yet anyway. I think binder jetting in general is an interesting process though. You know, it, 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 it allows for pretty much any material to be used, right? If it's in powder form and doesn't, doesn't oxidize. Um, and of course you have to have a post step, either infiltration or, or and or curing, uh, sintering. Um, but I understand that that's supposed to be their better system. And I've, I've always been impressed with what they've done with the material extrusion system. So no, I haven't done that, but I, yeah, my eyes are open for it. If anybody has access to that system, we could do an experiment and publish a paper. Uh, so maybe the person that asked the question will reach out right. to you. Yeah, and, certainly. and that basically brings to the last question from somebody else said, what is your contact information? <laughs> well, emac at utep.edu, E-M-A-C, but I guess um, the academy has some email to, to direct to Correct. Direct questions. Correct. And you could, Correct. yeah, Google Scholar me too, yeah. Okay. Eric, thanks a lot. This is uh, very delightful, and uh, thank you, and uh, looking forward to visiting you as well. Definitely. You got an open invitation. We'll get some enchiladas. Okay, so if you can uh, stop your uh, sharing, we'll uh, do a summary of uh, the session today. Thank you, and I will switch now to sharing. Can we see it? Yes, we can. Okay, so in summary, basically, uh, I think we have seen uh, primarily the aspects of AME technology uh, which is much more than a printed RF tag antennas. Uh, we have from different aspects, uh, uh, from adding uh, complete circuits, uh, the device structures and so on, to the fact of uh, uh, more of embedding uh, sensors and other activities in existing metal parts and other plastic parts for other industries where you want to monitor the performance of that final product, such as jet uh, engines and some others. Um, Basically, there is a, basically there's such a wide area of implementation as opportunity here that we do see additive manufacturing for electronics really changing the way things are being done. And I think we have seen so many examples today. Um, we can either do a single level or multi levels, uh, multi shape, two, two and a half, three D. Um, and basically, we have many advanced materials, both conductive and, and insulating, which are have been developed and some others under development. Um, in some of the future sessions, we are going to bring another uh, manufacturer of, uh, of, of materials. So we can see more uh, other aspects, uh, maybe from the dielectric side, um, which is an interesting area. Uh, and there are several complementary technologies such as the flash lamp to enable fur further optimization of the technology for sintering primarily and also curing as well as of course there is a, for high temperature electronics, which is a very important area as well. Uh, that's a furnace with the ceramic firing as a Professor McDonald just uh, covered. Uh, what we need is, uh, I mean, what is missing in general uh, is the effective integration between the ECAT systems and the ME fabrication system. Uh, I think the IPC 2185 it's uh, the first approach to that, and, uh, and it requires also the integration of the design rules so that the electronic designers can design ready for AME uh, without any additional uh, troubleshooting so that the first print will come very close to the design, maybe one more interaction. I have seen examples of uh, people uh, that have uh, overnight uh, basically optimize the design and uh, release it. Uh, also, the integration between ECAD and 3D MCAD is uh, essential uh, and to have a cohesive and complete simulation between electrical and thermal 
and mechanical. Uh, these last two things are primarily done in the MCAT side and um, we need that uh, better integration so we can uh, facilitate that. Uh, we are talking to the different uh, CAT companies but the move there is not yet. We'll see what will come out in the near future. Uh, the dielectrics uh, from the pure electronics point of view, it's not only just the thermomechanical, but uh, also the variety of dielectric constants, as well as very important, the low dielectric losses, especially for the RF and high speed digital. Uh, materials compatibility, they need to be <laughs> basically in, uh, meet all the requirements for the commercial, industrial, military, aerospace, and automotive. Uh, and the automotive has areas not only on the engine block, but also when you are exposed to the sun rays, uh, the sun direct heat, uh, as, uh, such as the cameras for the self-driving cars, which are in the, in the shield, in the windshield and so on. And uh, all those things are driving the development of different materials, especially in the dielectric area. So altogether, I think we have seen that the AME is starting to bridge the gap and actually taking over a part of the what is through the traditional PCB industry to create these uh, new structures, uh, new devices. And if we remember the beginning, we showed this uh, slide from the electronics industry roadmap. I think there are many aspects that the AME is going to basically become eventually the standard for manufacturing these things, uh, taking advantage of several benefits. As if we take into example the issue where we have the different boards, different components, and bringing all together into a complete heterojunction integration. This is the dream come true. And uh, I think it will take some time, but uh, eventually the industry will do it. As we see, for example, examples of a uh, vertical integration of components instead of the wire bonding. And that will also improve the performance from the RF point of view. Uh, we can see things of capacitors uh, for the building there, the RF components. Uh, all the bioadaptive manufacturing. So basically, and it's consistent with all the different presentations, the design is only limited by the imagination of the electronic designer and the product designers. So with this, I would like to thank uh, all the participants in today's uh, session of the AME Academy. And uh, we welcome you guys to join us at the next session that we'll announce uh, soon. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to seeing everybody as well as uh, any suggestions for the subjects or presenters, please feel free to address them to the AME Academy. Thank you very much.